The House Rules Committee today debated how to proceed with House floor consideration of tax cut legislation. The committee heard from the chairman and ranking member on the House Ways and Means Committee and others. Congressman David Dreyer chairs the three-hour hearing. Come to order. We're here for the consideration of H.R. 3, the Economic Growth and Tax Relief Act, Relief Act of 2001. I want to begin by welcoming my fellow Californian, Mr. Thomas, the distinguished chairman of the Committee on Ways and Means, Commi uh, Ways and Means for his uh, first appearance before this committee as chairman of the committee. I want to congratulate him on his fine work. I also want to recognize my very good friend, uh, Charlie Rangel, who joins us here. We all know that today is a very historic day. The Rules Committee prepares the first component of President Bush's tax relief plan for consideration in the House. We all know that President Bush has already changed Washington, whereas last year there was debate about whether a tax relief package was possible. Now, Democrats agree with Republicans that the American taxpayers deserve relief. Some want more tax relief, others want less. As President Bush said downstairs in his address to the joint session of Congress, the package that's come before us is, uh, in his eyes and mine too, just right. This Republican tax relief plan is a measure designed to do three basic things. Make the tax code fairer by reducing taxes on every taxpayer, particularly low-income taxpayers. Second, provide a boost to the economy. And economic growth is so critically important because maintaining the economic growth that we've enjoyed uh, is obviously what is going to provide us the revenues to address the education needs, the rebuilding of our defense capabilities, saving Social Security and Medicare and other priorities that we've established. And of course, we want to remove barriers to the middle class. Now, in the coming weeks, Republicans will move other very important aspects of President Bush's tax relief, the marriage tax penalty, the state tax relief provisions, among others. This tax relief bill is a very balanced and prudent approach because it provides tax relief to millions of working American families who are struggling under Washington's overcharges. Our plan is based on some very simple principles. The American people should not be overcharged on their taxes. And that if Washington is allowed to keep the taxpayers' money, Washington will be inclined to spend it. President Bush's tax plan is a key part of his overall vision of America's economic and fiscal future. President Bush's budget plan protects Social Security and Medicare, pays down $2 trillion in debt, provides overdue tax relief, and increases funding to important priorities like education and the environment. It's a great plan, and it is very deserving of our support. As I said, I welcome our witnesses, and I'm very happy to call on uh, my great friend, Mr. Moakley, who just did a wonderful job in testifying before the Administration Committee. Uh, and I was pleased to be there as his sidekick. Uh, Mr. Moakley. Thank you. The reason I did a wonderful job is because I completely agreed with the chairman's principles. <clears throat> That's correct. Um, much as I enjoy the company of my chairman, Mr. Dreyer, and other members of the committee, especially when we meet in daylight hours, this really is not the right time for us to consider a tax bill. It isn't the right time to consider a spending bill. It just isn't the right time to put before the House any decision about any portion of their budget because we have not yet agreed on an overall budget plan. Now, I don't say this because the law says it, the, the Congressional Budget Act commands us to act so. I figure that my chairman is clever enough to construct some technicality to suggest the law does not apply to Republican tax cuts. I don't say this because plain old common sense tells us that we should make decisions the same way any rational uh, individual or family or business firm would. And I know the Rules Committee is the place to go if you want a waiver from Budget Act requirements and the dictates of common sense. This is not the right time to meet on a tax bill because we need the context of an overall budget to see exactly what we can really afford to do. I sense broad bipartisan support for a host of important commitments, including providing tax relief. We agree on the need to continue to pay down the debt. There's also a broad commitment to invest more in education, more in national defense, and most importantly, there is consensus to undertake a serious shoring up of Social Security and Medicaid. 
Now, we may disagree on the details, the overall size, the distribution of tax relief, or how much to invest in education, or how best to shore up Social Security. But we cannot rationally settle any disputes over details in any one area of commitment without an overall budget to show us if we have enough left to fulfill all these other commitments. HR 3 is estimated to cost just shy of $1 trillion. This bill reduces tax rate, but it does not fix the marriage penalty. It doesn't provide relief for estate taxes. It doesn't renew expiring tax expenditures like research and development tax credits. We should, ask, we should not ask the House to debate HR 3 if we do not know whether there is room for other broadly supported forms of tax cuts. We should not ask the House to debate this trillion dollar bill without a budget plan to determine if HR 3 leaves room for increases in education and defense. We should not ask the House to debate HR 3 if we don't know whether this bill leaves us the resources we need to fix Social Security, to fix Medicare, to ensure that we keep our promises to the beneficiaries of those programs today and tomorrow. To say we budgeted for a tax cut last year and we didn't get one enacted, so we must be able to afford one this year is really a reckless line of argument. Imagine a family that said we budgeted for a ski trip last year, we didn't get to go. The fact is this year the family has new priorities. It'll be Jimmy's first year in college. Uh, we may want to look around for a new house, a nicer neighborhood. Uh, uh, we budgeted for a ski trip last year, so we must be able to afford one this year. Mr. Chairman, I just can't understand how you think it is fair to give a $15,000 tax cut to a family making $500,000 a year and give absolutely no tax cut, zero a year, to a working family with three kids earning $30,000 a year. But this is not the time to get into the substance of the bill. But I'd just like to make it clear right from the start that this is not the right time for us to consider a tax bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Moakley. Uh, we're uh, going to go to our witnesses. Mr. Frost is asked to make a, an opening statement. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to take a few minutes of the committee's time to recount to the members a history of the consideration of another important tax bill by the Committee on Rules. Mr. Moakley, Mr. Hall, and I are the only members here who were serving on this committee in 1981 when the House was about to consider the tax legislation originally proposed by President Reagan. So perhaps it would be useful for all nine of the majority members for me to recount to them the process the majority undertook 20 years ago. Mr. Chairman, 20 years ago, the House was engaged in a ferocious battle over the Reagan tax plan. While Democrats nominally controlled the House, there were enough conservative Democratic members who were supportive of the Reagan plan to cast in serious doubt the ability of the Democratic leadership to pass an alternative to the Reagan plan. A bidding war broke out in the Ways and Means Committee. Prior to the consideration of the tax bill, the House had considered a reconciliation bill which made massive cuts in government programs. The rule reported by the Rules Committee, which provided for the consideration of the reconciliation bill, was defeated by a coalition of conservative Democrats and Republicans on the basis that it was unfair and too restrictive. The majority on the Rules Committee had reported out a rule which made Republican amendments in order, but it did so by chopping the substitute into pieces. Those pieces, it was supposed, would be more unpalatable than a complete package and thus more easily defeated. This tactic was obviously an attempt to control the, pro to control the process, and quite frankly, it failed miserably. The reported rule was rejected and was amended by Del Latta of Ohio, a Republican member of this committee, on a recorded vote on the floor, 216 to 212. So a month later comes the next piece of the Reagan package. The reported Ra Ways and Means Committee bill was made in order as base text, but the Rules Committee also made in order two amendments and provided that those amendments would be considered in the King of the Hill process. This meant, of course, that the last bill standing would be the bill the House would adopt. In this case, the Democratic Rules Committee gave the favored position to the substitute offered by a Republican, Barbara Conable of New York, and by Kent Hans of Texas. 
The First Amendment was made in order in the rule was the amendment offered by Morris Udall of Arizona, which was a scaled-back version of the reported tax bill. It provided for a one-year reduction in tax rates, tilted charge pack taxpayers making less than $50,000 a year, along with targeted business and tax incentives. The Hans Conable substitute was to be considered second and that substitute reduced individual tax rates by 25 percent across the board over three years, indexed tax rates beginning in 1985, and provided large business and investment incentives. The Udall substitute was considered first on the floor, pursuant to the rule, and it was rejected by a vote of 144 to 288. The Hans Conable substitute was adopted on a vote of 238 to 195. Perhaps the Democratic leadership had seen the writing on the wall and thus was forced to make Hans Conable in order. Or perhaps there was just a sense of fair play at work, which moved the Democratic majority to make in order a range of options, giving members the opportunity to make a choice on a bill of such magnitude. We were given that choice 20 years ago. There is serious question as to whether the current Republican leadership is going to provide the House choices when this bill comes to the floor, even though the Democratic Rules Committee 20 years ago did provide a range of choices on the floor. The outcome of the final vote on this bill may well be preordained, but it is only fair play to give the House the opportunity to consider alternatives to this product. If we are to proceed in a bipartisan manner, it is only right that differing points of view have an opportunity to be heard. Democrats allowed those voices to be heard in 1981. 20 years later, the question is, will the Republicans? Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Frost. And we're still today enjoying the benefits of the Economic Recovery Tax Act of 1981. And so we're very happy that it uh, proceeded. Now we're pleased to uh, welcome the very distinguished chairman of the Committee on Ways and Means, Mr. Thomas. And uh, any prepared remarks that you have will, without objection, appear in their entirety in the record. And we welcome a summary. I thank the chairman very much. And I do appreciate uh, the review provided uh, to us by uh, my friend from Texas. Uh, I, too, was a member of the House at the time. Uh, and uh, if you want me to boil down uh, that analysis, it was this, that we had a Republican president and a Democratic House. And it was a failure of leadership in the Democratic House. Uh, that is not the case today. Uh, we have a Republican president and a Republican House. And I believe this committee uh, will provide a fair and equitable structure uh, for the discussion of this, as the chairman indicated, the first of a number of tax packages uh, that will be presented uh, to the committee. I'm here as chairman of the Ways and Means Committee on this package uh, primarily for one reason. Based upon the testimony that's been given on the Senate side and on the House side by some of those who have been given the ability to make basic decisions controlling the economy of this country, chairman uh, of the Federal Reserve Board, Alan Greenspan, for example, in which they indicated that although uh, fiscal policy uh, is something that can be used to assist in a downward turn of the economy, monetary policy is most often used because monetary policy can be placed fairly quickly into practice by a decision of a majority of the Federal Reserve Board. And in fact, that board has done it twice uh, in uh, the first uh, month of uh, this year. Uh, and uh, the statement by uh, Chairman Greenspan in front of the House Budget Committee that he thought he would wait until the next regularly scheduled meeting of uh, the Federal Reserve before uh, determining a further downward adjustment, in fact, drove the markets down because it wasn't made uh, in an intervening, <coughs> non-regularly scheduled way. So I think there's plenty of evidence uh, that uh, stimulus needs to be done. The reason Alan Greenspan said fiscal uh, stimulus uh, normally doesn't work is because it's not done timely. That oftentimes Congress is simply too slow to act. Uh, I wanted to make sure uh, that if in fact uh, the economy continues to move in the direction that it does, and it's fairly clear that the indicators are all downward, um, in terms of uh, growth of the gross domestic product, it's virtually flat. Uh, in terms of consumer confidence, it continues to go down. Uh, and uh, more importantly, a figure that tends to lag diminished uh, economic activity, the unemployment rate, continues to go up. All of the signs of our inability to pull ourselves out of this tailspin are there. 
And, and I thought it would be appropriate to take those portions of the president's plan that clearly, if we could make them law, would have a stimulative effect, and not only take the president's proposal, but to accelerate portions of it and make it retroactive uh, to this year, which would provide modest uh, resources, but more importantly, a clear psychological boost affecting consumer confidence that help is on the way and that this Congress will not be laggard. We will respond in a timely fashion in support of the president's desire not only to return the tax surplus in a direct and meaningful way, but to also assist in stimulating the economy. This is a portion of the president's program. I find it extremely difficult that uh, there are those who say a piece of the program can't fit uh, within the budget, when in fact their leaders are advocating a, a tax reduction of similar numbers. It is true we'll be addressing other areas that the president had mentioned, marriage penalty uh, reform, uh, death tax reform, uh, child credit reform, uh, and other areas that are important not only uh, to the economy but to members of this Congress who voted prior to this president arriving on a number of other tax adjustment questions. So we will be getting to those in due time. But the heart of the president's program, in which uh, the leading economists of the day say that there is an Im a potential impact for positive stimulus to the uh, economy if we move quickly, is before you today. My hope is that we, in fact, do that, that we move quickly. Uh, I believe in moving quickly, it will con create a condition uh, in the Senate that will uh, change uh, the discussion over in the Senate as though they have all the time in the world. The United States Senate may have all the time in the world. The American people do not. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Thomas. Mr. Randall. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman and my friends, thank you. I want to thank you for giving us uh, this opportunity uh, to present our position to this committee. Without it, I would not have had the slightest clue as to the thinking of my chairman, uh, since we would never had the benefit of any discussions on this section of President Bush's bill. We never had any hearings on this section of this president's bill. We never had any economists share with us the impact that this would have on on this bipartisan bill. And so this has been a very, very enlightening procedure for me as the ranking member of the Ways and Means Committee to see that the reason why we bypass the budget is because of the condition of our economy. And so therefore we need this stimulus to move swiftly so that we avoid a recession. Well now, then I, would be forced to believe that passing this one part of the bill, which just deals with the um, marginal rates, that this will be the engine to have the other body to move, since under the Constitution we need them to do something. Do they move on a full bill, or do they follow Chairman Thomas's genius way of saying, we got to do this in piecemeal? Because clearly the estate inheritance repeal uh, is not a part of this bill, and hardly we think that would be a stimulus to the economy since it really comes at a late time in one's life. You know. And then, of course, if we're dealing with the marriage penalty, well, that comes later too. Or does the Senate just take the marginal rates to stimulate the economy? Because if they do, this would be exciting since 10% of the entire bill, when you include the whole package, goes to 60% of the tax benefits go to 10%, the top 10% of the people. But 43% go to the top 1%. I can see these people now, those in the $900,000 bracket that are supposed to receive a $46,000 tax relief rushing out to buy a washing machine or perhaps a refrigerator to stimulate the economy. No, I don't think so. First of all, <coughs> nobody has said that we've had a recession. And no one has really come to our August committee, and we do have a little more self-esteem than we need, but they've never asked us for a stimulus, you know? They kind of thought that maybe that was Chairman Greenspan's position. And what did Greenspan say? 
be cautious in whatever you do. Now, true, he really doesn't trust you Republicans in terms of spending. He doesn't say that. But me knowing that you're the majority, I know you would not really not know what to do with the money that you would want to pay down the debt, I assume, and protect Social Security and Medicare. But, you know, it's a strange thing that uh, President Bush gave a speech and stole every good Democratic idea we had. And then said on top of that, he not only would save Social Security and Medicare and prescription drugs and education and improve the quality of life of those in the military, but guess what? If that wasn't enough, he found an additional trillion dollars to have in a slush fund. This is so exciting if only someone would put it down on paper so that we would have an opportunity to say, my God, we never knew that the Clinton-Gore years were that good for economic prosperity, that after you paid for everything based on a $5.6 trillion so-called surplus, ignoring the $3.4 trillion debt, of course, because that'll take care of itself, that we can now find an extra trillion dollars. But, as Joe Moakley said, when in doubt, waive the rules. So, don't be shocked that we're asking to waive the rules for us, too. If you have to do something political by saying now's the time for a tax cut, we will say that just in case we don't get everything that's projected and hoped for. Just in case the CBO is correct in saying that 90% of the time they're wrong. We say, why don't we just move a little easier on the tax cut? Why don't we say from the get-go that we got to use one-third to pay down the debt? Because this is the biggest tax cut of all to be able to say that interest is down, student loans are more acceptable, easier to get, that the small business people can do better. Interest rates going down is a break for everybody. And at the same time, we can guarantee that when we have this boom uh, with people becoming eligible for Social Security and Medicare, the money will be there. And then we have one-third for the tax cut, and one-third for the wonderful, newly found promises that President Bush has for relief, pardon expression to my Republican friends, but for relief for education, for relief for prescription drugs, to improve the quality of life of our young people in the military, all great bipartisan ideas. But give us a blueprint, because some people fear, reminding those that were here in 1981, that when you run out of money, you're not going to increase taxes to take care of these programs, but you're going to reduce the programs. And so what we're saying is this. It's too late to reconsider having a, a budget first. And I hope you bring us back to the Rules Committee, because then maybe my chairman will explain how we get the Senate to go along with this theory about piece by piece. Maybe they take it up. One week, they take up marginal rates. The next week, they take up marriage penalty. Then they'll take up inheritance tax. Maybe they'll take up the alternative minimum tax, which costs, I think, about $300 billion to adjust. But we know that you won't be able to deduct local, state, local and state taxes under this existing marginal thing. And we also know that while you give release to some people under the alternative minimum tax, you've got to increase their taxes, but this will be taken care of sometime, somewhere, perhaps in conference, we'll take care of it. But some Democrats believe that it's important to get reelected, and this may be a political issue rather than an economic issue. So we're saying that if you're going to take a gamble, take half of it, and give us an alternative, give us a substitute, give us a chance to try to do a better job. And I think that would be more in line with the bipartisanship that the President talked about than the procedure which we so far have followed on the Ways and Means Committee. Thank you very much, Mr. Rangel. We appreciate uh, your testimony and yours as well, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Goss? No, Mr. Moakley? Yeah. Mr. Rangel, are you, are you telling me that you haven't seen the, the bill that, that 
it's before the... Oh, no, we came. saw the bill the day before this came up for markup, so he was yeah. fair enough to have it in. No, when did we see the bill? Two days. Under the rules, the appropriate timeline, two days. Two days, yes, two days before that, uh, we a piece of paper was floating the around. The same rules you folks had when you were in the majority. Let me make it clear, for those who want to condemn how Republicans uh, uh, treated, how they were treated by Democrats, if you think that's an issue, then we can discuss it. I'm here supporting President Bush, who is bipartisan, who's reaching out and starting a new day. But anytime you want to get partisan, I can review my position. Uh, now, do you think you can debate this thing adequately in a half an hour? I would hope. It, de it depends on on how long the majority is going to give to explain this, this piece of what could become a very complicated tax bill, which is only a piece. But I would say that if they were to get two hours, that we could handle an hour uh, in terms of a substitute. So two hours overall, uh, uh, three hours overall for the debate of this? I would say three hours. Three hours? OK. Uh, is there any? Uh, part of the bill that you feel that uh, you, uh, uh, your side, was not fully brought up to par on and during the hearings? You can bet you how much time to have for that. The cost of the bill, just the cost of the bill, since we're dealing just with, you know, a tax bill is like grabbing a balloon. If, you, if you're going to take one part of it, you've got to impact on other parts of, of the tax code. Since we don't have the other parts of the tax code, we haven't a clue. You're not going to tell me that this president intended for you to reduce taxes on a certain number of people, and then when they go to get to the alternative minimum tax, the accountant says, oops, you had a lot of tax relief, but you never dealt with the AMT. Don't raise that because we're going to take care of it later. Well, how much does it cost for later? How much does the bill cost? You know, we have indebtedness that we have to pay. It doesn't come up in a tax bill. Guess where it comes up? In a budget. I think that's estimated to be three, four hundred billion dollars. These are things that have to be paid for if we're going to say, now is the time for speedy tax relief. We may agree now is the time to do it. But you can't just take one piece at a time and vote on it. You have to find out what is the impact on everything else. The reason why this is so skewed to the rich is because of the repeal of the inheritance tax. People say it's unfair for you to say that 43% of this go to the top 1% because you've included the inheritance tax repeal. Hey, President Bush included it. Republicans included it, and I included it. Except it's not in this bill. No, it's not in this bill. That, that's my point. Neither is marriage penalty in this bill. How can Republicans say they want repeal, they want marriage penalty, but it's coming down the line? Since that's the, next. Since the budget is not going to be passed before this bill, is there any other indicator you can use in, when you make when you figure out a tax bill if the budget is not in, in uh, it has not been passed? No, you can uh, shoot crap and pray that God will protect our great republic as she always has and that, uh, uh, that we do have the surpluses that are speculated and that we'll get by one way or the other. You know, it took a long time to get out of the 81 deficit, but good leadership did it. And maybe, you know, we'll get out of this hole if we get into it. Thank you very much, Mr. Ringo. Thank you very much. Just let me Mr. Uh, Mr. Rangel, uh, would you detail briefly the substitute that you would like to offer? First of all, we take one-third of the entire so-called budget surplus and dedicate that to protecting the Social Security system, that's $900 billion, and providing for debt relief. One-third we would give to the tax part, which I'll get back to, and one-third we would take care of those problems like education and uh, prescription drug relief and those priorities that both the president and members of the 
of the House had, at least during the campaign promises that we've made. When it comes to how do we target the tax relief, rather than concentrating on the top of the tax rates, we concentrate on the bottom by creating a 12 percent tax rate, which the, the basic uh, the, uh, the, uh, the tax rates, that is, uh, uh, would be based on the $20,000 of adjusted gross income. And in addition to that, we don't take the position that income tax is the only tax that working people have. We think the payroll tax, the Social Security tax, that is, the Medicare tax, we think to 80 percent of the workers that actually pay more in payroll taxes than they do in income tax really think that's a tax on their income, the difference between what they make and what they take home. So we bring immediate relief to these working poor people and moderate income people by expanding the earned income tax credit and taking care of it, and also giving relief to uh, those that suffer a marriage penalty just for being married. In addition to that, uh, we do bring relief, unlike the Republican bill, in terms of inheritance tax. We do not repeal it. But we do bring the exclusion up to two million uh, per person, uh, four million for a couple, and that works its way up to five million. And that is the tax portion of the one-third that we have in our substitute. Is there anything in your substitute on the marriage penalty? Yes, we do a double the standard deduction for relief. All right, so the substitute you would like to offer is what you have just outlined. Yes. I would ask Mr. Thomas if he uh, supports or, uh, or opposes your right to offer that substitute. Well, well first of all, I, you know, I really hate to interject facts uh, in this discussion since uh, Apparently, some folks are just warming up, but the substitute that was offered in committee, in my understanding, the substitute that was presented to the Rules Committee does not include uh, the death tax provision. Now, well, perhaps, Mr. Rangel just said that it did. I'm, no, he is right. Perhaps I'm mistaken. Corrected. Perhaps I'm mistaken, but all I do is read the bills. I, I stand corrected that uh, the parliamentary rules prevented us from being able to bring that. I forgot that the chair wasn't dealing with the tax bill, but only a part of the tax bill. Right, so, Mr. so I stand corrected. So, Mr. Rang since we, we were able to get the marriage penalty relief in the substitute. Okay, well, I would ask Mr. Thomas, do you support or oppose his right to offer the substitute as he's now outlined it? Uh, the letter that I uh, submitted to the committee was that I support an appropriate rule. It was our job to craft a package which is in front of you, notwithstanding the fact the inaccuracy of the description of the package, and it's your job to write the rule. I'll support whatever rule is written by this committee. So you're not, you're not opposing, you're not saying no. the committee should uh, automatically reject offering, le letting Mr. Rangel offer his substitute. You're I simply not expressing a view on the substitute. I certainly would not want to tell you what your job is. You folks have a difficult job. You need to consult among yourselves and you need to provide an appropriate rule for us to discuss this measure, which is, by the way, inside a budget, since it has been made retroactive to 2001. Any of the discussions about the fact that there isn't a budget in place to discuss this particular tax bill was also inaccurate. Now, Mr. Thomas and I were elected the same year, and we've, we've served together for, this is our going into our 23rd year. And Mr. Thomas, uh, you are familiar that some of your predecessors uh, on the Ways and Means Committee did come to this Rules Committee and asked for a closed rule on tax, uh, tax legislation. I would tell the gentleman that my preference, uh, if you're going to ask me that question, uh, would be that this committee does not make amendments in order. It's difficult enough for us to deal with uh, tax bills in their entirety as structured. Uh, and I would certainly, uh, if you ask me to go on record about whether or not various amendments would be made in order, it would be my strong preference, and I would assume that the ranking member uh, as well would not want to take our tax bills and expose them to any number of amendments that the Rules Committee and, may want to make in order. I would prefer you don't offer amendments. And, Mr. Thomas, uh, some of your predecessors even objected to substitutes being made in order. 
Uh, they, some of your predecessors as chair of the Ways and Means Committee wanted totally closed rules without the opportunity to offer a substitute. Uh, I understand that, but that really is to the procedure of how the measure is handled on the floor. I prefer that you not open up our package. If you choose to offer a package to the minority in the wisdom of the Rules Committee, I would uh, urge you not to open up that package. No, I, I, understand. I understand what you're saying. You don't want individual amendments to your package or to the uh, substitute to be offered by Mr. I just Rangel, think that, that was not my question. I understand that, but I'm telling you, that would probably make dealing with the tax code absolutely impossible. And yeah. that's the reason I would support that position. But whether or not the minority is given something that only this committee can give them, I would leave that decision up to this committee. And I think that's a, a wise position on your part because, as I said, some of your predecessors did not share that view and wanted, the, uh, wanted us to uh, grant only totally closed rules without the opportunity for a substitute. Might I respond? Yes, yeah, sure. The gentleman knows me, and I'm not them, I'm me. That's why it's... So, yes, I know you want to hear that. You wanted to make sure he was hard. The chairman, he's yeah. been uh, uh, very fair, and he's demonstrated that on, on non-legislative matters, he can even be bipartisan. Yes, I, well, and I would add that while I often find myself in, disagree in disagreement with the gentleman from California, the gentleman is reasonably consistent in his views, and I think that is very important. And so I think that it is a wise position he has taken that you would not rule out a substitute being made in order. I have no other questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Frost. Mr. Linder? Mr. Engel, you said something that piqued my interest. That is that you, your substitute would aim more of it to the lower income people by expanding the earned income tax credit. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, my question is, how far do we go since the bottom 50 percent of the income earners pay collectively 4 percent of the taxes? income taxes. They're not paying for defense. They're not paying for veterans' benefits. They're not paying for education. They're not paying for our parks. You don't want them to pay for Social Security and Medicare either? Well, it is a tax, and these, you know, most of the so-called surplus, or, or rather the, the favorable cash flow that we're having, is not attributed to high-income people, but to productivity. So to a large extent, uh, they have provided us with this, this prosperity, and I think they should in some way be able to share in it, especially if we're talking about a stimulus uh, tax package. Most everyone, conservative or liberal, Republican or Democrats, would agree that if you want to stimulate the economy, you put the tax relief in the hands of those people who are more likely make purchases and stimulate the economy. So following the suggestion of the chair, this is where we think it should be. Ms. Lo oh, please, please do respond, Mr. Thomas. Thanks, gentlemen. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, if you'll look at this particular piece of legislation, what happens to only be seven pages long. It isn't all that difficult and complicated. The retroactive portion that was accelerated is lowering the lower rates from 15 percent to 12, uh, and will eventually arrive at the 10 percent that the president asked for. Since that's the lowest rate that's being adjusted immediately, every taxpayer will get exactly the same benefit. Those who pay the least amount of income taxes and those who pay the most. This is not skewed immediately in terms of its acceleration and retroactivity toward the higher taxpayers. Every taxpayer will get exactly the same amount of relief under this bill in the first year. And as far as making the process uh, uh, unfair, uh, I just have to tell you the facts of the committee markup. There were two amendments offered by the Democrats, two. We accepted one of them. Now, if in fact what we're supposed to do is accept every amendment that the Democrats offer, or we're not being bipartisan, then that's certainly a different environment that I've ever been in. We accepted half of the amendments that were offered. On the substitute offered by the gentleman from New York, there were three Democrats who voted uh, not to support uh, his own substitute. So uh, when you listen to what happened in the committee, uh, I hope some of you uh, were actually uh, watching uh, the process. Uh, and, and just uh, finally, uh, let me say that there will be more. And as the President said 
to the joint session of Congress, not just income tax relief, which is what we're looking at today. The President has proposed proposed significant modification to Social Security as well. Those individuals who do not pay income tax are not affected by this bill, but they will be positively affected by the decisions that this committee makes, I hope in a bipartisan way, uh, over the months to come. All taxpayers will ultimately be benefited by the President's program. It's just that there has to be a sequence or a timing to it, and the most appropriate uh, uh, portion to bring out first is that which has the maximum impact, everyone given the same amount the first year if they pay income taxes. Thank you. Mrs. Slaughter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Rangel, I see that the price tag on the Democrat substitute is $585 billion over 10 years. What is the price tag on, on the Thomas bill? It's close to a trillion dollars. Over 900, 900 billion? 958. 958. According to the uh, Joint Committee on Taxation sheets, which have been available uh, for a number of days. Mm -hmm. And unlike the tax bill of Mr. Thomas, yours does include the earned income tax credit and the change in rates for the lower income people plus the marriage penalty. Is that yes. correct? Any, everything that we pretty much talked about except the estate tax. Exactly. Um, now, I think, frankly, let me state right off the top that I really want you to be allowed to off this, but I'm curious about the three Democrats that voted against you. Did they also vote against Mr. Thomas? Yes, they did, because many people truly believe that the most important thing, whether you're Democrat or Republican, is to have a budget. And so we could understand those Democrats who wanted to be consistent. Others thought that since we really felt that there was room for some type of a tax cut, let it be moderate, let it be fair, mm -hmm. and let it be within the framework, uh, at least as to how you perceive the budget, and that is one-third, one-third, one-third. The thing that concerns me, and I, I, I probably would have been one of those Democrats, my concern is that you know, given this opportunity to really pay down the debt, which to me is the ultimate tax cut for everybody, it seems such a shame that we're, we're not, I don't believe, going to be able to achieve very much of that if this tax bill passes the House as written by, by the majority. And I, I really would like to associate myself with the words in uh, the dissenting views uh, that, that you made in Ways and Means. Because, once again, it strikes me that memories are extraordinarily short. That in 1981, we went through the very same exercise. And as you pointed out, it took us 18 years to pull out of that hole. Uh, and as I understand it, CBO's estimates have not been right in 75 years. Isn't that about right on surpluses? Uh, we are really building this, I think, on, on grains of sand, which are very troubling to me. Uh, and without any way to get out of it, once you've identified that you're going to be doing this for 10 years, we're, we're out there, no triggering mechanism, no back out position, uh, no way that we can get away from it. And I remember what, Dr., uh, what uh, Stockman said, I've heard that again, that, that he realized that as they started working this thing all up into little pieces and bits, as this one is being done, and that they all grew in such a way, it became the bidding war that you mentioned a while ago, that we found ourselves in a terrible situation with deficits. I can't understand why memories are so short. I mean, when I was elected in 1986, we thought we'd have deficits for the rest of my life. Uh, it's been miraculous what we've been able to do, and that we are so willing to suddenly throw that over and to get back into it bothers me greatly. And I, I, I while I think the Democrat substitute is high, I would much have preferred uh, not spending that kind of money. I would have, again, like to have paid off the debt. Uh, I certainly hope that this Rules Committee will see fit to let us put that on the floor and debate it, because I think the American public, too, is very much concerned. They do have memories, and I find that in most people I talk to understand if you've got a debt, you don't go around giving away money. You take care of your debt first. And we've Mr. had so few opportunities to do that, certainly, Bill. We've had so few opportunities to do that. For us to not follow this one seems to me to be a, a mistake of great magnitude. Yes. Might I respond briefly to the Absolutely. gentleman? Absolutely. Thank happy. you very much. I do want to make sure that in our exuberance of describing um, what we're doing and how we're doing it that, that, we, that we are accurate. Uh, first of all, uh, any budget that might be written uh, is really written only for one year. We do a succession of one-year budgets. Some of us, uh, the chair particularly noted, have wanted to talk to at least going to two years to try to write a budget. Any tax plan is required by the Senate rules to be projected out over 10 years. The House rules only require it be projected out over five. 
The point I hope members understand is that in taking the president's tax plan, which wasn't supposed to be uh, in effect until 02, by accelerating and moving it retroactively to 01, that the portion that is effective in 01 is under a budget, the only budget that we can have, this year's budget. To continue to say that we are moving a tax bill without a budget in place is to simply not understand the legislation or the budgetary process. No one writes a budget for five years, let alone 10 years. You write a budget every year. The current budget take, it, it takes into consideration the portion of this tax plan in this year. There is a budget that fits the plan as presented as long as any budget can, whether Democrats were in the majority or Republicans are in the majority. If you have a problem talking about a five or a 10 year tax plan, when you only have a one year budget plan, then you need to perhaps to address the budgetary process because it doesn't stretch out far enough to cover your concerns. But if your concerns are that this tax measure is being moved without a budget in place, that's simply not true. The budget is in place, this fiscal year's budget, and this tax plan fits in this fiscal year's budget. And Thank I the gentlewoman very much. Mr. Chairman, right. could I, could I Mr. Agree? Rangel. I'd like to agree with my chairman. Good. Thank you. Uh, well, let me ask you Oh, oh I'm sorry. Right. I thought you'd complete it. I, I thought nice. that would be a nice note to, uh, to end this on. Mr. Slaughter, well, please I, proceed. I, I want to say that, that, Excuse me for uh, interrupting. that you're right. We operate on that budget. As I recall, we passed just before we went home at the end of the year. Uh, but we have a new president now. And we'd very much like to see what his priorities are and how much money he expects to spend in all these categories. And I don't find that unreasonable, since we usually start the budget process about now, that we would like to have his budget that be debated and hope voted on, but at least we'd like to have, a, some, have some idea what's in there and how he plans to pay for all of this and what, where the money is going to go. That's not an unreasonable request, that we would have the president's budget before us before we pass this tax bill. Mr. Chairman, Thank you. the President's right that that we are working under some one-year type of budgetary situations now. But two or three things are abundantly clear. That this so-called tax bill goes beyond one year. It goes to 10 years, and most of the revenue losses is after the first five years. Another thing that's abundantly clear is that at the same time that this locks into place, the recipients of Medicare and Social Security will become eligible, and we expect the 40 million to, to explode to 80 million. The last thing is that we haven't the slightest clue as to what the surplus is going to be during those the next five years, of the following five years. And so it's great to say you're just legislating today. But you're legislating for 10 years. The tax cut is permanent unless we're prepared to cut it back. Thank you exactly the same dynamic on every spending bill that has ever been voted on by this Congress. And when the Democrats were voting spending bills, I heard no discussion about the surplus in out years and whether or not we could afford them. I find it ironic that the argument is made when you want to give some of the people's money back, but when you want to spend it, that argument is never presented. Thank you very much. Mr. Slaughter? Thank you very much, Mr. diaz Blart. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think it's um, extraordinary that in less than two months, President Bush has managed to change the agenda in the country, so much so that our colleagues on the other side of the aisle, instead of asking for tax increases, are coming before us today and requesting for us to permit them uh, to ask for a tax cut in less than two months, Mr. Chairman. It's remarkable leadership. The more the American people get to know what the President is requesting, the more they are going to support him. Um, I commend uh, you, Chairman Thomas, for bringing forth this piece of legislation. I see that there are some simple but profound concepts in here. Am I correct that no taxpayer will pay more than a third uh, of their income in federal taxes? Uh, you're correct in terms of the final uh, reduction of the marginal rates from 5 to 4, uh, finally in uh, 2006. And that uh, those uh, who pay less in income tax will have their income taxes, their rate reduced from 15 
to 10%. That's by a third. Am I correct? Uh, and there are a number of people who, because of that reduction and the income that they make, will pay no, tax, no income taxes at all. Uh, and I would ask uh, you, uh, since uh, these are such important uh, measures, and especially since a number of our colleagues, I'm sure, are having the opportunity to, uh, to uh, view these proceedings, if you could expand further. Mr. Well, Chairman, on what this legislation does? I tell the gentleman that it is only a seven-page bill, uh, but uh, we've said it's the heart of the President's program because it provides permanent rate reduction. That is, the percentage that's multiplied against your income is reduced. It's simplification because there are fewer levels. Uh, and it is the kind of long-term permanent relief that, frankly, should be put in place given the tax surplus that we currently have. But. Uh, I do believe that the President Bush should receive all of the uh, support and uh, 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 indication of his leadership uh, that the gentleman has given. But there is another reason why this bill is in front of you uh, just two months into this session. The gentleman from Texas indicated the problems they had in 1981 and a few of those Democrats that didn't stay with them. I think if you go back and check the record, um, the partisan split in the House of Representatives in 1981 was 277 Democrats and 158 Republicans. Uh, and I find it remarkable that the Democrats were not able to control uh, the process uh, in the way in which uh, they desired. But I think it also indicates the power uh, of reducing people's taxes. Uh, they went through a number of machinations to try to not let it happen, and they lost control. The fact that we're before you today, I think, illustrates uh, leadership uh, on the Republican majority side, uh, beginning with the Speaker uh, and uh, uh, ultimately leading to this committee's decision to place this uh, on the floor. So it is the fact that we have a Republican president. I think you'll find that the um, swiftness of tax relief provided uh, also depends upon who's in control uh, of Congress. Uh, it's been fumbled uh, in the past. Uh, by the Democrats when they were in the majority. Uh, I believe it will not be fumbled by the Republicans now that we're in the majority. And I thank the gentleman. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Mr. Thomas, you are here truly in a, in a historic time in your role as new chairman of the Ways and Means Committee. Reference has been made several times to the 80s and to the uh, Reagan tax cut. Uh, for the record, during the 80s, after the tax cut, revenue nearly doubled or did double during that time, but unfortunately spending tripled. Therefore, you had the deficits that Mrs. Slaughter referenced when she uh, came here in 1986. When I came here in 1994, or after the 94 elections, uh, I remember very specifically, because I was one of those that wanted to pay down the debt, but I wanted to have tax relief. And yet, at that time, every projection that you looked at is that we would have deficits as far as the eye could see. But we felt that, you know, we had to address this in the best way that we could, so we passed the Balanced Budget Amendment 1997. And we were supposed to, under that, under that Balanced Budget Act, we were supposed to balance the budget in 2002. We missed that projection by 60 percent in a very positive way, uh, I might add. So what we're entering into now really is a different era, and you're going to be the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee uh, in, in that regard where now there are reports coming out that, in fact, we can pay down all the national debt that you have to pay down without in incurring uh, penalties by 2010, which raises the question, what are we going to do, therefore, uh, with all the money coming in? Uh, I, I think that this, uh, this tax plan, uh, although it's not everything, uh, we'll have uh, uh, other plans in the future, uh, is very, very timely. And I just want to uh, lend my support to what you and the Ways and Means Committee uh, have done in that regard. Thank you, gentlemen, very much. Uh, uh, I do think if we are going to turn to history and look at what happened, uh, those who were here, for example, uh, in 1993, uh, when uh, President Clinton gave his State of the Union message, uh, and as I recall, that uh, joint session uh, showed a majority of Democrats in the House and a majority of Democrats um, in the Senate. Uh, and the message was that there were deficits as far as the eye could see. Uh, six of President Clinton's eight years were, in fact, under a Republican majority in the Congress and to a very great extent. Uh, the fear that the gentlewoman uh, from New York had about deficits as far as the eye could see have been reversed. 
Uh, so the gentleman is quite correct. If we're going to revisit history, we ought to take a look at it in terms of uh, what actually happened when who was in control. Uh, I appreciate uh, uh, the gentleman indicating that this is the first of a number of packages. Um, I, I can only imagine what the discussion would be if, in fact, we brought them all uh, in front of the committee. Uh, I appreciate the concern that you have about the management uh, of the House. Rest assured uh, that uh, this is the first of a number of bills fully within the budget, fully paid for, making sure the debt continues to be paid down. And as a matter of fact, some of uh, Chairman Greenspan's testimony, I tell my friend from uh, the state of Washington, was his fear that, in fact, we will pay down all the debt that can be paid by 2006 rather uh, than 2010, and we're going to have to figure out uh, what to do with the money that we have available. This is truly a completely different era. And I don't say that it's simply a coincidence uh, when, in fact, this decision, never before wrestled uh, by the country, occurs with a Republican president, a Republican House, and a Republican Senate. Mr. Chairman, may I just say that, you know, we're getting so historic here, but I, didn't bring that I don't think... I don't think anyone can deny that we went from the deficit to, to an improved economic condition during the Clinton-Gore years. And in the 1993 budget, not one Republican, not one Republican in the House supported it. And it took Al Gore to break the tie in the Senate uh, to support it. And if you look at the record and ask who was president, it would take a lot of imagination and a whole lot of rhetoric to say that a lot of the credit, and some should be due to President Bush before him, a lot of the credit has to be done to the budget direction in which uh, President Clinton has taken us, just for the record. Yeah, well, uh, I, I would just like to say I find this a, a fascinating time where we are debating uh, the degree uh, of tax cuts. I never thought I'd ever be in a body, uh, the legislature, certainly in Congress, where we are now debating the, diff the, the degrees of tax cuts. But Mr. Rangel, you mentioned uh, uh, deficits, and you and you attributed that to uh, to the legacy, I guess, of uh, the Clinton-Gore administration. Uh, I might say. I might say one of the legacies is Republican president, Republican House, and Republican Senate, but then that's another argument. But within your substitute, do you deal with debt relief in your substitute? Yes, we do. We take one-third of the entire thing, not directly in the tax bill itself, because neither bill does, but in terms of our overall framework of how we reach the amount of relief we give in taxes, we attribute one-third of the so-called surplus to debt relief. But we also take in consideration in our bill the cost uh, of, the, of the debt service, which is not included in the Republican bill. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I um, was going to make several of the comments that my colleague just did, so for brevity I won't repeat that, but I did... Um, want to uh, ask a couple questions just so I'm sure I understand, uh, Mr. Chairman, when we talk about who's going to get tax relief, isn't it my understanding correct that everybody who pays taxes will receive tax relief under this bill? Uh, I tell the gentlewoman, um, for clarity's sake, if, if she would say income taxes, since this is a bill that refers only to income taxes. Uh, and that it's structured in a way that anyone who pays income taxes either will get relief or will wind up paying no, ta no income taxes at all at the conclusion uh, of this bill's effective date. And there are approximately 6 million families that will be removed from the tax rolls under this bill? That's correct, in terms of uh, moving the marginal rates down and the amount uh, that would be paid by those individuals. Well, I, like my colleague, I'm delighted that we're in this situation because I also was one of those that came in in 94 where we did put some fiscal discipline back into things. And um, it's very encouraging that we're at this point. Thank you very much. Mr. Sessions. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, uh, Chairman, I'm delighted that you're here today, and I know that you've taken uh, a lot of heat over what you have done in support of President Bush's plan. I'll tell you, I don't intend to sit here and disagree with you. I wish it were bigger. I wish it were more retroactive. I wish it were a lot of things. But I, when I ran for Congress, said that I would try and utilize some common sense about what we did in Washington, D.C. And my common sense and memory tells me that 
President Clinton and the administration were not only opposed to a balanced budget, but not in favor of surpluses. And that they were, that was their official position well into 1997 at the time both were created. Uh, so I understand who is for the tax collector and who is for the taxpayer. Uh, and what I see very clearly today is, is that we have H.R. 3 that is before us that will cost $363 billion over five years. In, in discussions that I've had with Secretary O'Neill and seen him publicly state this, that he talked about last year at the end of the first quarter, there was a surplus of about $46 billion last year. This year, there is an approximate surplus of $70 billion. If I go uh, 70 times 4, that's $280 billion this year, and yet we're talking about over five years, $363 billion is all this will cost. We could almost pay for this in one year and a half instead of over the five years that we're talking about it costing. My point is this, is that there are many people back in my district, and I think I've seen them and heard them around the country, who are in increased financial strains and stresses, the increase of energy cost, the increase of college, health care, prescription drug cost, a lot of other things that all families are having to pay, and yet we see very clearly today that the Democrat Party is only for certain people that really do not even pay taxes, they're the only ones that can get relief. Once again, it's the middle class people who not only have I worked with in the past, but people who are trying to make a go of it, in fact, would be denied that. So well, the gentleman, you I know. am, at, not at this time, I will in just one second. My colleague and friend from Texas, I will allow him just a second. So my argument or common sense tells me that if we take something that is a modest plan, something that can be paid for literally in a year and a half of surpluses, forget the five or 10 years because we're going to stretch it out over 10 years, that we can give people back money and they will have more power in their lives. And instead of Washington having this power, because money is power, that they will have an opportunity to have it back in their homes. I would yield to the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Frost. I find the gentleman's statement confusing, and perhaps Mr. Rangel may want to respond also. The gentleman, if I heard the gentleman correctly, he said the Democratic Party was only for tax relief for certain people who, who don't pay taxes. That's not at all what Mr. Rangel testified about. Mr. Rangel talked about a uh, rate, a reduction in the rate. Uh, Charlie, didn't, uh, didn't I hear you correctly in saying that part of your substitute was for reducing the rate for people who pay taxes? For everyone that pay taxes, it's just that we concentrate in the low and moderate income taxpayer and also and, and if I could ask also, the gentleman, what we, is that we amount? We do include 12 percent. We do include uh, as the bottom rate. And, and, and how much money is that, sir? I don't have the exact amount, but it's uh, roughly for the entire uh, tax bill. It's around uh, $500 billion. But no, sir. Uh, for, an, uh, for a family, what would be their income? I think it's $600. $600. Well, family, He's asking well, the family, the annual family income. I think. Yeah, the family six hundred dollars for a family of four. And what would that income level be that we're talking it about? It would be uh, the adjusted gross income of twenty thousand dollars. See, that's gross, what I'm talking about. Gross Excuse income, me, but to gross answer. Gross income of forty thousand. Uh, Mr. Income Sessions was saying that. We so to make my point Mr. to Mr. Frost, so that I'm very clear, then families to $40,000 householded income would be my point that I would make. So I thought above I heard that you level, it does bother me. I thought I heard you to say that it was only for people who didn't pay taxes, and you could not have meant that. Well, the, 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 you, could, you, could, you, you couldn't have meant that, uh, that we, were, we were seeking relief for people who didn't pay taxes. I, I, I would like to respond back so I will can take the time back, Chairman. Uh, as Mr. Frost knows, we are engaged in an open discussion where when someone makes 
a statement, they might be challenged, and I appreciate that. I will go and state what I intend to say, and that is that I believe that the plan that we see before us today, the Democrat Party, is directly related to evidently families who have householded income of $40,000 or less. And I believe that other people are also entitled to that, and that is why my common sense tells me everybody needs an opportunity to pay their bills, not just the federal government. Well, if the gentleman, I, would, if the I, gentleman would yield just a moment, moment. I, I, well, Mr. I, Mr. Chairman, I, but I'm, I'm asking, Mr. Sessions. We spent over an hour on this panel, and uh, I know this is a very important bill. Mr. Sessions. I yield back the balance of my time, Chairman. Mr. Reynolds. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the as you know, a dynamic analysis accounts for the growth that a tax cut will create. Have, have you done a dynamic analysis of the uh, revenue impact over the 10 years uh, based on uh, your proposal that uh, is before us with $958 billion in tax cuts? I, I'll tell the gentleman that uh, there is an ongoing debate over so-called static versus dynamic scoring. Uh, and the numbers that are used uh, are not completely static, but they certainly aren't dynamic. Uh, the phenomenon that the gentleman from Texas indicated about the revenue that is still coming in, notwithstanding uh, the numbers that we're seeing about the economy declining, is a lag similar to the unemployment rate that lags the downturn. Uh, and one of the things that will guarantee that that surplus doesn't continue to come in at the rate that the gentleman from Texas indicated uh, was to, is to do nothing. Uh, if you want to make sure that you stimulate that surplus and it continues to come in, uh, we need to make sure that the consumer confidence is up where it was last year when that revenue was produced, where the gross domestic product is up last year when that revenue was produced in consumer confidence uh, as well. So what we really need to do uh, is to probably not spend a long time, although I think it ultimately will be fruitful if we examine the ability to say if we make this change, what will occur in the society if this change were made, and what will be the revenue produced by that? That is a, a technical expertise that we, at this point, do not yet have, although I think all of us know that behavioral decisions affect the behavior of others, and that if we pass this tax cut, the economy will be in better shape, therefore probably producing more revenue than is estimated. The reverse is also true. To do nothing guarantees that those numbers continue to go down and that our chances of having those projected surpluses go down as well. And finally, if I might, I would tell the gentleman from Texas that I've taken a lot of heat on a lot of things and there's no more pleasure in terms of taking heat uh, on a bill uh, which reduces the American uh, 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 working men's uh, and women's taxes. Uh, to the ranking member, uh, the gentleman from New York could, uh, could assist me uh, in the Thomas bill. Uh, the median income of my district is about 34.5. The tax savings for a single wage earner or a family of four, of which in my district there are several, uh, the reduction would be about $1,400, removing most of the tax. Could you tell me under your plan roughly where you think uh, the savings would be to uh, the median income of... Uh, of uh, New York District and upstate New York? It's generally be about half of what is estimated under the chairman's bill. But uh, I just don't want to take away from the courageous political position that our chairman has taken, but I just want to say in my 50 years in politics, uh, tax cuts hasn't really been a profile in courage. Thank you uh, very much, gentlemen. We appreciate uh, your being here and uh, this... Uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Frost. I would ask for just a, a little additional time, I, if I may. Mr. Frost. Mr. Chairman, I, I, we were cut off a little earlier a while ago, and I just want to be clear because I don't want to misstate anything that Mr. Session was, Sessions was saying or any point he was trying to make. But if I understand the, uh, the chairman's testimony, the, excuse me, the ranking member's testimony, Mr. Rangel, that families up to 40000 would be targeted, uh, fa families up to $40,000 in income would be targeted for tax relief under the Democratic substitute. 
And Mr. Sessions was saying that the Democrats weren't trying to give, were only trying to give tax relief to people who didn't pay any taxes. And, and that simply is not the case, uh, Mr. Sessions. I mean, I, uh, I think you misunderstood and uh, it's certainly possible because these numbers are complicated. It's hard to follow this sometimes. But that you misunderstood what Mr. Rangel was testifying to, because clearly people of family income 40 and below do pay taxes. We're, we're not. We weren't targeting people who don't pay taxes. Uh, Charlie, did I? Is well, that correct? Not only is that correct, but you get relief above the 40,000 gross as well. It's just that we give most of the relief at that category and below. Are you 100% uh, correct, but, uh, Mr. Reynolds? Would the uh, Mr. Frost yield, uh, in the point that I uh, outlined in the, th the example of my median income of my district, 34.5, the $1,400 reduction would take uh, a taxpayer in New York paying $1,400 in personal income tax and reduce his obligation to zero. So as we're playing on whatever words there might be from Mr. Sessions and uh, uh, Mr. Frost, I would say that the Republican plan that's before us with Mr. Thomas reduces the obligation of the median income of my district to zero, whereas the Democratic substitute plan would still require half of the taxation or that individual hey, still Mr. be paying tax. Chairman. My, my comment. Uh, Mr. Chairman. My, let, me just, let, me, uh, let, me, let me just say that uh, we've spent an hour and a half on this panel. It's been very interesting. We have uh, two pages of witnesses to come before us who have an interest in this uh, bill. What I'd like to do is uh, we've, we've uh, heard from lots of people here. I'd, Mr. Thomas, as chairman of the committee, I'd like to uh, have make a, a closing statement. Then we'd like to move on to the next panel. And we continue this debate with the next panel. Uh, well, first of all, I want to uh, thank the Rules Committee. Uh, it's always uh, a pleasure to appear before you. Uh, and uh, for the record, I would like to provide uh, a bit more detail to the question uh, that the gentleman from New York, Mr. Reynolds, asked me. Uh, because he asked me about yes. the static versus the dynamic scoring, mm -hmm. and the answer I gave him was that institutionally, we've not been able to do that yet. Uh, notwithstanding the fact that uh, my colleague, the gentleman from New York, the ranking member, said that there was no uh, uh, testimony or hearings, uh, I, I do have to say for the record that uh, the noted Harvard uh, economist, uh, Martin Felstein, uh, testified when we had our hearing uh, on the president's uh, tax proposal that his dynamic model indicated that it would be uh, an increase of revenue beyond what no change would take place uh, at the level of about $1.1 trillion over 10 years. Uh, that is, I want to underscore uh, Professor Martin Felstein of Harvard's estimate of what the dynamic scoring would be, more than a trillion dollars additional income uh, beyond what we would have had otherwise. That isn't an official scoring approach, but it's someone who's thank been around much, a long time. Mr. And Thomas, I want to thank you very much, Mr. Thomas, and thanks to both of you for being here. I, we appreciate your testimony. Mr. Rangel. Just for the record, and I'll be very brief, first of all, I said we had no hearings on the Thomas part of the tax bill. That was on the President's bill. And I just want to tell my colleague, uh, Mr. Reynolds from New York, under the Thomas bill, uh, you will be unable to deduct local and state taxes. And so therefore, whatever relief you get, you will have to pay for it with the alternative minimum tax. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Thomas, uh, and then uh, I'm going to try to I, I, move I on to the next panel. I understand, but just I so said the last word would go to Mr. Thomas, so I if Mr. Wrangle interrupts you again, we'll give you the last word. Uh, I won't interrupt. Uh, I do understand the difficulty of understanding complex legislation at times, but the seven-page bill in front of this committee is the President's marginal rate reduction proposal with the lowest rate made retroactive to this year and accelerated from what would otherwise have been a 15% rate to 12%. That is not a very complicated change. In fact, it would only produce more revenue rather than less under the Felstein structure. And let me say that although this is the first opportunity for us to appear before you with tax uh, reduction uh, proposals, it certainly will not and be the And we look forward last, to your next appearance. Including the Republicans' willingness to address yes. the alternative minimum tax problem, which was created right. primarily in the 93 right. tax bill. Right. Thank you very much, Mr. Thomas. We appreciate it. Thanks to the panel for being here. And uh, next, we'll uh, hear from a panel uh, being led by another member of the Ways and Means Committee, the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Tanner, who's joined by Mr. Stenholm Hill and, Hall, uh, Hill and uh, Moore. Gentlemen, please come forward, and uh, we uh, welcome... Uh, 
summary and any prepared remarks you have will appear in their entirety in the record. Mr. Tanner. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to come before the Rules Committee, and uh, I think we've got everybody here. I, uh, Jim Turner stepped out, but I think he's here. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I and a lot of other members on our side were, were very hopeful that uh, with the new president in town and with his uh, avowed purpose to change some of the way business was conducted in Washington, we were very hopeful that that might actually come to pass. Instead, we uh, get a state of the union or a budget speech on Tuesday night. We get uh, the joint tax uh, bill uh, assessment and the bill itself late that Tuesday night or Wednesday morning have a markup on a trillion dollar tax measure on Thursday at 10 o'clock in the Ways and Means Committee. Uh, if that wasn't what most of us had in mind when we envisioned a new day in terms of bipartisanship and input and conversation and what do you think? Uh, could we get together and work something out? Some of us very much want to do that on a tax bill. The other point I would simply make is uh, we were hopeful also we could get away from mincing words on what, for example, it depends on what the definition of is is, and for the chairman of the committee to argue that this tax bill is technically under a budget resolution that was passed when no tax bill was contemplated that was uh, passed uh, last year and that has little, if anything, to do with uh, what we're presently contemplating uh, goes back to those days of what it depends on the definition of is. is. This is uh, uh, something I believe that no one could seriously argue. For example, uh, you argue that uh, one could argue that this is technically under that budget, but on the one on the one hand, on the other hand, one argues that if we don't put the whole tax bill in place uh, and we or if we did and put a trigger on it then they argue that you're going to raise taxes when the trigger doesn't uh, when the trigger has to take effect so it's not a one-year tax bill at all and the proponents of it know that and admit that by even discussing uh, a trigger that would result in a tax increase but all that aside all that aside uh, there are those of us on our side of the aisle who feel very very strongly that without a business plan that contemplates what we're about to do in terms of putting into place a tax bill that is for more than one year, uh, we ought to have a budget that also contemplates the same thing. I, for one, would like to know in response to what the Secretary of the Treasury said when he said that uh, he was going to hold the tax bill to $1.6 trillion no matter if it cost him his job or not. I'd like to know what's going in that $1.6. I'm interested in the state tax relief, marriage penalty, AMT, uh, R&D extenders. Without knowing what all of those or how all of those fit in, you know what? Everything fits or nothing fits. And according to the markup, everything fits. Well, if you take that position and you think you're an optimist, as most of us around here are, I'd just soon say that the, the, the uh, budget uh, surplus is going to be $10 trillion. Uh, what's the difference? We don't, we don't know. We don't have a budget. And uh, to contemplate what we're about to do, one could argue that this does technically fit the budget the first year because not very much tax relief in the first year. That's the only way one could credibly argue that. And so I thank you for coming thank here. You very we much, would Mr. like Tanner. to uh, appreciate your being here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stenholm. Mr. Chairman, I uh, want to first say that Chairman Thomas was totally correct when he said that this bill technically comes within the Budget Act. But I, like Mr. Tanner, thought January the 20th we changed the dynamics of definitions of words and began a new era in which we will live up to the spirit of the law. And I don't believe anyone 
in this body will argue for very long that the spirit of the law, the Budget Act of 1974, requires a budget before we consider any spending or tax bills. And I, I think it, it is not helpful for the new majority, total majority, to begin arguing on technicalities when there is much bipartisan support for dealing with the budget in a manner and spirit in which the president has called for. But the president's plan is important, but it's not the only voice. Congress has a responsibility to deal with the budget. It's ironic that tomorrow the House Budget Committee has scheduled a hearing to give members an opportunity to testify about their interest regarding the fiscal 2002 budget. But at the very time that members of this body are being given our first opportunity to offer testimony and about the priorities of the 2001-2002 fiscal year budget, we're being asked to cast a vote on a major portion of the president's budget. Even senior members of the president's own party are questioning many of the details of the budget, but that's not my purpose of being here today. Our insistence that Congress act on a budget resolution before voting on tax or spending legislation is not an argument about the arcane budget rules. Rather, it is about acting responsibly to balance priorities important to our constituencies. You ask the simple question that I've heard here today and many bragging statements about cutting taxes, 100% of my constituents have asked a simple question, are you in favor of your taxes being cut? The answer is yes. But if you ask a second question, do you believe that your taxes should be cut at the expense of Social Security reform, the answer is no. If you believe your taxes should be cut at the expense of Medicare reform, the answer is no. If you believe that your taxes should be cut at the expense of the defense of this country, the answer is no. If you believe that the taxes should be cut at the expense of agriculture and food production, the answer is no. That's why we argue for living up to the spirit of the budget law not the technicalities that the chairman is hanging his hat on and apparently the leadership of this body, but let's live under the spirit of the budget law that says we should debate all of the priorities, including a tax cut. And make no mistake about it, we are in favor of cutting taxes. I will conclude, Mr. Chairman, by saying this. I was a member here in 1981. I was one of the Democrats that helped the Reagan administration pass the tax cuts of 1981. Were I to know then what I know now, I would have voted differently, but I would not have voted any differently based on the facts presented to me in 1981. But I, uh, not the time today, unless you want to ask me some questions because I can tell my time has expired, but I will uh, be the first to debate some of the myths that I have heard from members of this committee talking about what happened. It's interesting that in the 1980s, at no time, did the Congress ever spend more money than President Reagan asked us to spend? That's a fact, and you know it, and everyone else knows it. I have done a little research on my own since I've been elected in 1978. Discretionary spending, we have cut by 35% since 1978 as a percent of our gross domestic product. We have cut defense 38.7%. We have cut foreign aid by 50% since 1978. So when people start talking about spending, we, the Congress, in a bipartisan way, have not done nearly as bad a job as some suggest that they do. Our problem is that revenue has gone up. And that's why we agree that we must have a tax cut to, re to restrain the amount of money that we are taking but not at the expense of paying down the debt. My final point is, I believe that most of you will find, as I have found in my district, that my constituents have already received a tremendous tax cut this year in the lowering of interest rates. Thank that you very is happening. Much. Mr. Hill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, read my statement and to enter it into the record. <clears throat> Many of us in the House from both parties agree with President Bush on a number of budget priorities. We believe in paying down the national debt, 
strengthening Social Security and Medicare, increasing spending on our armed forces and our schools, and using some of the budget surpluses to give American families tax cuts. In a perfect world, we have all the money we needed to take care of all these priorities. But it's not a perfect world, and we have to make some tough choices. If we want to give people bigger tax cuts, we'll have to take some money out of Social Security and Medicare. I'm convinced in this. If we want to pay down more debt, we'll have to restrain spending on tax cuts. This House has set up a process that forces us to make tough choices between our competing priorities. That process is called the budget resolution. And I agree with my good friend and colleague, Congressman Stenholm, when we're playing games, if we really believe that we're following the rules. We may be technically following the rules on the budget process, but clearly we're violating the spirit of the rule. It's the same process every responsible American family and business follows before you start spending money. Sit down and figure out how much you have. And that's all we're asking that this body do. Unfortunately, the leadership of this House has decided to throw both common sense and the budget rules out of the window. They have decided it's a lot easier to promise everything to everybody than it is to write a budget and make some tough choices. But I urge the leaders of this House to reconsider that decision, to push the tax bill through this week. Let's be responsible, follow the rules. Let's pass a budget resolution before we take up tax and spending. Thank you very much, Mr. Hill. I have no questions. Mrs. Myrick? Mr. Moakley? Mr. Sessions? No questions. Mr. Frost? Mr. Chairman, respectfully, uh, I know that you're concerned about the length of time that people are testifying and questions are being asked. I would only point out that when we were in the majority, we started hearings at 10.30 in the morning, and we often had a long list of Republican witnesses, and we heard every one of them. And uh, on a bill of this magnitude, I would hope that we would not wait until 2 o'clock in the afternoon to start hearings. Well, I will just say that I'm not intending to deny any member of the majority or the minority the right to testify before this committee. <coughs> Mr. Reynolds. Mr. Chairman, just an observation. I'm excited to see that we're no longer discussing whether we should or should not have a tax cut. We seem to be in agreement we should. It's just process that we're uh, having some deliberation over. Thank you very much. Gentlemen, thank you for being here. We appreciate your testimony. Uh, next, uh, we'd like to... Uh, entertain testimony from uh, the panel. Uh, Mr. Horn, Mr. Smith, Mr. Flake, and Mr. Pence, I see are here. Gentlemen, if you'd come forward and uh, we will hear from, uh, from each of you. Mr. Horn, any prepared remarks you have will appear in their entirety in the record, and then we will uh, welcome uh, summary. Just pull the chair over. Perfect. Mr. Horn. Mr. Chairman, Please turn the microphone on. Mr. Chairman and ladies and gentlemen, uh, we're here talking about various triggers uh, that have happened before and we think now need also. And that'll bring accountability and responsibility to those long projections beyond five years. Five years is difficult enough for economists and others to say, well, this is what's going to happen. Well, if it doesn't happen, then we have a problem. We want to keep moving down the public debt and so our grandchildren don't have to deal with it. And uh, we have uh, a, an experiment that we already have done, April 27th, 1999, in the congressional record. We had a trigger, and that's the one I'm proposing today, uh, that goes with relation to the interest rate on bonds. and. Uh, we have others that are just as good, and Mr. Smith here has done a tremendous amount of work to it, and uh, Mrs. Uh, Tauscher uh, also has it, and uh, I think uh, you will w agree that this is a witness named Alan Greenspan that said in 1999 what we should do then before the Committee on Banking and Financial Services. He said, that he uh, felt uh, using the surplus to reduce the federal debt is an extraordinary effective force for good in this economy. Again, I have a letter here from uh, Mrs. Uh, Marge Rockema and from Michael Castle. I'd like both in, without in objection, the record. Without at objection, this point. they'll be included in the record. Yeah, Mrs. Uh, Rockema has uh, said she questioned uh, Mr. Greenspan, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, and he again said, 
he believes in a trigger. And I believe over the weekend, a uh, week and a half ago, uh, the President of the United States said, gee, maybe we ought to have a trigger on spending. Good point. Now, what we're trying to do is get taxes cut down and to deal uh, with a reasonable standard, an indicator that has some validity to it in terms of the interest to the public debt and uh, getting down to as low a point as we can that doesn't deny flexibility of the Treasury to manage the debt. So uh, those are the three things, I think, and I'll Thank you very yield much. to my colleagues the rest of the time. Thank you. Mr. Smith. Mr. Chairman, may I uh, uh, present for, the, uh, for your committee a, yes, a copy absolutely. of this? Uh, uh, I, uh, what, what, uh, what should make us all very nervous is the danger of uh, uh, increased spending. And I give you one example. If we'd have stuck to the 97 budget caps, the new baseline for the next 10 years, the spending would be $1.7 trillion less than the baseline that we're now looking at because of the increased spending over and above what we set limits for ourselves in 1997. I'm suggesting a double trigger a trigger that would put some caps on spending, and also a trigger that if revenues are less than anticipated, uh, we would slow down uh, the rate of the tax cut. The tax trigger, uh, drafted as an amendment to H.R. 3, would delay the phase in the year after any year in which the federal revenues fell below 19% of GDP. If federal revenues fall below 18% of GDP, the phase in would be reversed by one year. Uh, now the spending trigger. Under the CBO baseline, total federal spending as a percentage of gross domestic product is projected to decline from 17.7% in 2002 to 15.1% in 2011. The spending trigger, uh, drafted as a standalone bill, uh, would be separate but tie barred and it performs an across the board sequestration of spending under the graham rudman hollings legislation when the Office of Management and Budget determines that federal spending exceeds 18% of GDP. The sequestration would reduce federal expenditures to 18%. Uh, the danger, I think, uh, Mr. Chairman and committee, is uh, Social Security and the problems of Social Security. If we add additional expenses to Medicare, it, it further compounds the problem. The chart that I've asked it to be distributed represents uh, what the surplus is going to be if uh, the tax cut goes into effect and uh, under the provisions that we don't use any of the trust fund money, we actually dip below the line and would have uh, not a surplus but a negative cost. And so the danger is increased spending, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. On a slightly different issue, Messrs. Pence and Flake. Good afternoon, Chairman Dreyer. It's an honor to be with you today. but particularly poignant because I represent the 2nd District of Indiana where today over 200 layoffs were announced at the Dimer Chrysler fa factory in Newcastle. Uh, Congressman uh, Jeff Flake, who joins me here today, and I are very much on the record as freshman members of this body who are uh, defenders of tax cuts and reducing the tax rates for working Americans to turn this economy around. Uh, this morning, after considerable wrangling about how to best move up tax relief in H.R. 3, I was pleased to see that the President's own chief economic advisor, Larry Lindsay, expressed some misgivings about the tax relief contained in H.R. 3. He told the Washington Times, I wish in the first year we could have had a bigger tax cut. This was exactly the response that Congressman Flake and I had that led to our amendment today. The amendment that we offer is an effort to do all we can to send the American people tax relief this year. The amendment is both affordable and reasonable. It protects Social Security and the Medicare surplus. More than 22 of our colleagues have pledged to co-sponsor the amendment, and our amendment has the official endorsement of the Republican Study Committee. The collective conventional wisdom on tax cuts, Mr. Chairman, seems to be that they often come too late to act as an aid in stimulating the economy. Treasury Secretary Paul O'Neill, Federal Reserve Chairman Alan Greenspan, the President, and just about every editorial commentator has weighed in on this point. They've all made the point that tax cuts, if they are to be effective, must come as quickly as possible. 
This advice from all quarters has the ring of truth because it is only common sense. If consumer confidence is the fuel of economic recovery, an economic recovery that we desperately need in the second district of Indiana, then the expectation of tax relief. The Blake Amendment before you today is not unreasonable. It merely moves some of the tax relief promised by H.R. 3 ahead so that all sectors of the economy will see some relief right away this year. President Bush has championed retroactivity. His State of the Union address made clear that making tax relief retroactive would be a jump start for the economy. So too, rather than sending early tax relief to people in only one tax bracket, as H.R. 3 currently does, our amendment would make good on the President's pledge that, quote, in his tax plan, no one is targeted in or out. Uh, Madam Chairman, this perception of delay has important economic consequences. Suppose there's a special sale at your favorite store scheduled for next week where all prices will be discounted 10 percent or more. Do you shop today or tomorrow? Or do you wait a week? The answer is you wait a week. The same principle holds for interest rates and tax rates. If people anticipate lower rates in the future, they are likely to delay spending and investing decisions until they can capture the benefits of those lower interest and tax costs. The reasonable Pence Flake Amendment that we propose today is, only, is also an important tool for the House. We should give our colleagues an opportunity to vote on retroactivity. We may not get another vote this year that so directly targets our country's economic slowdown and the slowdown that we're experiencing in East Central Indiana with 200 layoffs today. While I'm mindful of the leadership's desire to target a debate on this issue, I believe that all members, Republicans and Democrats, would welcome the opportunity to do something right away to respond to the layoff headlines and bad economic news. I thank you very much, Madam Chairman, for this opportunity to raise our concerns, and I would respectfully ask for your support for including our amendment. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, let's go and see if we have any questions. Mr. Sessions, do Mr. you have Flake. any questions? One more. Oh, Mr. Flake, I'm sorry. Uh, I no didn't problem. realize that. Forgive I won't me. take long, uh, my colleague, Mr. No, Pence. You, you can give her the you questions. Can. <laughs> Good one. I won't take long. I'll just take a minute and just note that when the president came here to deliver his speech, uh, he urged retroactivity, and, and he didn't just urge it for the bottom bracket. Um, it, it was a pretty blanket statement, and that's what this amendment does. It says that uh, if you pay income tax, you'll get tax relief this year. And I think that that's important, and uh, Mr. Pence spelled out the reasons why. I, I would just urge adoption of the amendment, and I think it's important that our colleagues on the floor have a chance to vote on it. Thank you. You're most welcome. I come from a state that has had the biggest loss of manufacturing jobs of any state in the Union, North Carolina. So I'm very sympathetic to your concerns. Thank you. Uh, yes, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, for Mr. Pence, Mr. Flank, uh, Flake, I would like to say that, uh, that what you are proposing, I support and agree with also. Uh, I believe that we've got to not only quickly bring the uh, relief to America, but also do it in a way for everybody. Uh, of course, it costs money if you're a tax collector. But for the people who are back home who want and need this money now for their families, now for an opportunity to make up for the things that are occurring uh, and to bring back America, I believe it's the right thing. I'd also like to ask unanimous consent uh, that uh, I include in the record a letter uh, from Empower America, a young man named Jack Kemp, uh, who is in support of what uh, uh, these two congressmen, Jeff Flake and Mike Pence, are attempting to do, and will do my very best when we uh, convene to make sure that we attempt to make this uh, in order. And I thank the gentleman. We'll be glad to accept that. Mr. Frost? Yeah, could you briefly uh, say how this differs from the provisions in the bill itself? As to which? which your, amendment, your, your, amendment, your amendment. Your amendment, yes. Could you, uh, you bet. Um, <clears throat> the bill itself uh, says that uh, this year only the bottom rate would be retroactive. It would move from 15 to 12 percent and then down to 10 percent in subsequent years. What this amendment does <clears throat> is it says that there will be uh, each bracket will receive see some retroactivity this year. The top rate would move from 39.6 to 39. Uh, the 36 rate would move to 35.5. 
uh, and, and so on down the line. Uh, there are small moves, but it's important to give uh, retroactivity everywhere. And we were careful to ensure that we're not dipping into Social Security or Medicare. We got this scored by joint tax, and uh, so we've been careful there. Were, were you all in the room when the chairman testified? Because the chairman testified that he didn't want any individual amendments made in order. Uh, he was uh, he didn't rule out a substitute being offered by the Democrats, but he did say he did not want individual amendments made in order to his bill or to the substitute. So you're, you're aware of his testimony. Uh, I, I didn't hear that specific yeah, he, testimony, he, Mr. Frost, but I appreciate you calling it to our attention. Yeah, yeah he, he did say that very specifically because I asked him about uh, the type rule that he would he's requesting as chairman, and he was uh, opposed to anyone, Democrat or Republican, being able to offer individual amendments to either bill. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Frost. Uh, gentlemen, thank you very much. Yes, thank Mr. You. Smith, you had may, another. May I have the, uh, the graph that I handed out to make part of the record? Uh, yes, you may. We'll be glad to do that. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all. We've got, yeah, we have uh, Mr. Obi, and um, if you don't mind, if Mr. Spratt and Mr. Turner and Mr. Taylor and Mr. Boyd would like to join at the table so we can do another panel. Mr. Turner, yeah, come on up so we can just go ahead and do it. Mr. Taylor and Mr. Turner, come on and join at the table. Well, it's not, it's not really a panel. I just said come on up and you can all just sit here and we'll go down the line and testify. So yes, I understand. You We're may have different issues. Right. We're just making it a panel for the sake of convenience this afternoon, okay? Thank you. Mr. Obi, please go Thank ahead. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, the same way we're, we're referring to the budget as the budget referred to this tax program. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing means it. <laughs> Let me say that uh, what I've heard here today reminds me of a family that goes on an expensive uh, month-long vacation uh, and then gets home and says, okay, now that we've had our fling, let's put together our family budget for the year. I don't know many families in my district that would do that. Uh, I have heard today a number of uh, comments about 1981. I think all our experience in 1981 shows is that experience is the quality that enables you to recognize a mistake when you make it again. Uh, and uh, in 1981 was a mistake, and I asked this committee not to repeat it. I'm asking this committee to do, uh, first of all, my first preference is to grant no rule whatsoever on any tax cut until we have a full budget before us. And the reason I ask for that uh, is this. I have in my hand, as someone else from Wisconsin used to say, um, a newsletter which I sent to every household in my district back in 1981. And in it, uh, it describes the tax package that was passed, and uh, it uh, uh, points out the fact that it took us from 1776 to 1968 to run up the national debt to $370 billion, and it took the Reagan administration's tax bill exactly two years and nine months to do the same. Uh, the first four-year costs of that action uh, amounted to $600 billion in deficits. And when you ask why, the author of the plan told us why in his famous confessional in Atlantic Monthly Magazine. He said as follows, we didn't add up all the numbers. We should have designed these pieces to be more compatible, but the pieces were moving on independent tracks. It didn't quite mesh, that's what happened, but you see, for a month and a half, we got away with it because of the novelty of it all. That was David Stockman speaking, the director of the President's uh, Budget Office. A reference was made to the fact that there were th uh, several alternatives to that plan. Uh, one was the Udall O.B. Royce plan, which received 144 votes, a majority of Democrats, and five courageous Republicans. Uh, we did not prevail. Uh, and we sent this country in the process into an 18-year ditch, which we've just now climbed out of. <coughs> um, uh, as, the ch as the ranking member of the Appropriations Committee, I think I have an obligation to point out uh, three problems 
with the, the president's uh, approach and with the committee's approach. First of all, it, it wildly underestimates what the president himself will wind up spending in his own budget. Defense, for instance, for the last three years, we have been told that the defense budget was not large enough by our Republican colleagues. I would point out that if all we do on defense is hold defense constant as a percentage of GDP at around 3 percent, which is where it is today, that will cost an additional $500 billion over 10 years above the baseline that be, that's being talked about today. So throw that out in terms of, uh, uh, throw $500 billion off the table in terms of having any surplus. I do not believe that this Republican administration is going to cut defense as a percentage of GDP. Secondly, uh, if you simply continue the trend line for education, uh, which increased at 13 percent a year for the past five years, if you simply continue that trend line, we will wind up spending $410 billion more over the next 10 years for education than the uh, baseline being talked about here today. So that's another $400 billion people are pretending <clears throat> is on the table and is available for tax cuts that, in fact, will not be there. There is also the assumption being made there will be no special assistance to farmers over the next 10 years. In the last three years alone, we had over $30 billion in assistance to farmers, and I would predict that they will grow, uh, not, uh, not shrink. So I would join uh, Mr. Stenholm and others in asking you to approve no tax bill until we have an entire budget. If you do propose a tax uh, or allow a tax bill to come to the floor, then, instead of the phony uh, response to economic uh, stimulus requirements that uh, I believe is in this bill, I think you ought to have a real one. Uh, Mel Laird was my predecessor, a good, straight Republican. Mel Laird supported for a number of years a proposal which was made by Robert Solo, who was then a member of the Council on Economic Advisors for President Kennedy. And basically, uh, uh, what I'm asking you to do today is to provide an opportunity to offer an amendment. I've already introduced the bill. Um, uh, to offer an amendment, I'm asking this on behalf of myself, Mr. Moran, and Mr. Frank. And that uh, proposal would provide a real uh, uh, economic stimulus package. Uh, it, it, what it would do is simply give the president permanent standby authority to cut the bottom tax rate whenever you have one quarter of economic growth less than one and a half percent and a projection of uh, the same slow growth in the next quarter or when you have two successive quarters of growing unemployment. It would trigger off after one year. The advantage of that approach would be, first of all, you would uh, not incur 10 years of costs in order to fight a recession. Secondly, the reduction in taxes would go into effect immediately so that you would not have that added money in the economy at a time when the uh, economy is coming out of a recession. The problem when you do that is that you then add to inflation as you're coming out of a recession. You raise interest rates and you cut off the recovery. Um, the main problem with the Reagan package, if I can go back to real history as opposed to rewritten history, what happened is that we passed that bill. We passed uh, uh, the Graham-Latta uh, budget. Shortly after that, the markets <clears throat> tanked. By, the, by that fall, long-term interest rates had gone up by 2 percent. And, and by a year later, we had 4 million additional people out of work. That's the historical record. And uh, I think we ought to avoid it by making sure, as Mr. Stockman says, they did not make sure last time that all the pieces are considered at the same time so that we do not have a run-up of this picture. The green bars here represent the promises that were made if we passed uh, that 1981 tax cut, that deficits would be reduced in nice, neat increments until we were at zero in 1984. Instead, the red bars represent the deficits that were act that actually occurred. Uh, I don't think this is a an experiment in economic stimulus that we want to repeat. Madam Chairwoman, I do not have a written statement. 
I come here to raise concerns about the application of the Budget Act, and in particular, several sections of the Budget Act which are summarized by language in the Congressional Budget Act of 1974 as codified, all caps, it says in the heading of several sections, summarizing the principle for which all these sections stand, concurrent resolution on the budget must be adopted before budget-related legislation is considered. Concurrent resolution on the budget must be adopted before budget-related legislation is considered. We're obviously flying in the face of that provision. Now, technically, we skirt Section 303, as I understand it, because of the language of Section 303. But as I will explain, we are violating, if we bring this bill to the floor now, Section 302 of the Budget Act, Section 311 of the Budget Act, and Section 401 of the Budget Act. We'll get into the technicality of that just briefly, but before we do, let me say that this is the core principle of the Budget Act, that we will not take in the beginning of any fiscal year any action individually until we have a common plan for all of our actions, until we put all the pieces of the puzzle on the table comprehensively, revenues and spending, and put them together, and we know the aggregates for both, we know the resulting deficit or the resulting surplus, and we know the long-term implication of the budget. Without that, we don't have a budget process. So that's what this is all about. Section 303 says, until the concurrent resolution on the budget for a fiscal year has been agreed to, it shall not be in order in the House of Representatives with respect to the first fiscal year covered by that resolution to adopt a, a bill that uh, would reduce taxes or reduce revenues during that fiscal year. I say that we skirt that because the curious wording of subsection 2, which says that first provides an increase or decrease in revenues during that fiscal year. And this bill first provides an increase in revenue, a decrease in revenues during the current fiscal year, so we get around that. But I don't think we get around the principle of it. And there are three more sections that once we get around this section, we run head on into. Section 311 also establishes a point of order against spending legislation that exceeds budget authority and outlays that were set forth in the budget resolution adopted for this year. The pertinent provision of Section 311 states, it is not in order for Congress to consider le legislation that would, quote, cause the level of total new budget authority or total outlays set forth in the applicable concurrent resolution on the budget for the first fiscal year to be exceeded or for the total of that fiscal year and the ensuing fiscal years for which allocations are provided under Section 302A. The current level report, which was filed on February the 28th of this year, provides $55 million for additional outlays for the Ways and Means Committee in fiscal 2001, $3 billion in 01 through 25. Now, you, you, you may say you're talking about outlays and budget authority. That's true. This tax bill contains uh, a child tax credit, which is refundable, and the refundable portion of it is treated by uh, by budget law as an outlay, $4.3 billion between 2001 and 2005, exceeding the amount that the budget re resolution provides. Section 401 of the Congressional Budget Act states it's not in order for Congress to consider legislation that provides new entitlement authority to become effective during the current fiscal year. The increased Refundable taxes in this bill are scored as new entitlements. And since the tax rates in the bill first become effective in 2001, this year, the refundable increase, uh, and, and there's a refundable increase in 2001 as well. So it's, it therefore requires a waiver of Section 401. And you run into a similar problem with Section 302. I know all of this is nitty gritty. The fundamental principle, though, is emblazoned in the code itself, and it says, as I said, no budget-related legislation shall be adopted until you have done a concurrent resolution. Without that kind of discipline, we don't have a budget process. That's what's at stake here. That's the core principle. And I would ask you to embody that in this bill, to, to not to waive these important principles. You may think that you need to put this bill on a fast track to bring it to the floor now. This precedent may come back to haunt you in the future. We could bring it up in the future for a big entitlement increase. 
instead of for spending reduction. So I've come to speak for the budget resolution for that comprehensive thing that has served us well, particularly in the last 10 years, that the discipline of these provisions that have taken us from a deficit of $290 billion to the surplus that we day today would uh, dissipate in part for tax cuts. Let's do it the right way. Let's stick with those disciplines. Let's abide by these rules. Please don't wait. Thank you, Mr. Spratt. We appreciate all your commitment to the process over the years Thank and the you. hard work that you've done. Um, let's take questions of Mr. Obie and Mr. Spratt before we move on. Mr. Linder. David Doe, uh, I want to deal with some facts, too. Income for the government in 1980 was 519 billion. Federal income in 1990 was 1 trillion 54 billion. It doubled. The only thing your chart didn't have on it was spending. And spending dramatically increased. I think the old saw was $3 for every dollar in tax relief. But the one thing that struck me, you said that after the Reagan t budget or tax bill of 1981, I think it was. 91, was it 81 or 82? 81. 81. <clears throat> In the next year, interest rates, long-term interest rates went up 2%. No, the same year, within three months. In three months. Well, since they inherited 21% interest rates, uh, I'm talking about long-term interest rates, not not 60-90 uh, day. Long-term interest rates were never were never 19 percent. Well, primary it was 21 percent. Not long-term. 1980, and inflation was 14 percent, and home mortgages were 17 percent in 1980. And if I have my numbers right, the interest rates came down about 125 basis points a year until 1993. Well, if you'll check the record, you will see that the gram ladder budget passed the House in June of 1981. During the next 90 days, long-term interest rates rose by more than two full percentage points from the point they were at, at the, on the day that gram ladder passed. And then what happened? Then what happened is four million additional people lost their jobs, the, uh, the country tanked, the stock market tanked, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, we uh, developed deficits. Instead of going from $70 billion to zero, we went from 70 to, to, 200, to $208 billion. On annualized deficit basis, you're talking yeah. about? Yeah. And what were the deficits supposed to be this year under the last 1993-1994 uh, bill that was passed? Well, when, the pre when President Clinton took office, uh, the last act that George Bush uh, undertook before he left office was to send Congress a budget. And that budget projected that by 1993, I believe it was, uh, 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 or, or um, I think it was 93 or, or, or 97, I've forgotten which. But by then they projected that without policy change, deficits would be about $500 billion a year. So the president in 93 took action. There were two things that happened. George Bush, uh, senior, uh, first took action against the wishes of half of his party and swallowed some increases in taxes and some cuts in spending in the, in the 1990 budget agreement. That began to turn the explosion in deficits around. That was step one. Step two was Bill Clinton's budget in 93, uh, which, uh, which uh, took those projected uh, $500 billion deficits and turned them around and began to bring them downward. And Bill Clinton became the first president uh, since, the, uh, since World War II to actually uh, reduce uh, and, re and, and repay a portion of the debt during his term of office. That 10-year projection of that budget projected this year we'd be looking at somewhere in the range of $400 billion in deficits. If you believe in 10-year numbers, yes. If you believe in them, I congratulate you. I don't believe in anybody's numbers. I would point out that the 10-year numbers that are being used to justify this tax cut right now have changed 75% in one year. Anybody who believes numbers under those circumstances is a fool. We were projecting to have $400 billion deficits. Are you saying we wouldn't have under the 1993 budget agreement? Under the 1993 budget agreement? Well, I don't understand your question. That budget agreement projected that by now we'd be looking, the, the deficits turned down for a short period of time and then went right back up into the 400 Yeah, and my point year. is, my, uh, my point is uh, regardless of what people uh, were projecting, so what? Their numbers have always been wrong. 
That's why, in my view, we should not pass anything more than tax cuts one year at a time until we know what's actually on the table, nor should we make spending commitments for more than one year at a time. Would anybody run a business with one-year projections? Would any, could you, could you would, float a stock issue at any Would in the any world? sane CEO commit to fixed costs for the next 10 years, knowing that he was relying on a 70% increase in revenue and profits in the 7th, 8th, 9th, and 10th years of the next decade. I submit to you any, any CEO who would do that would be out on his ear within six months. Uh, I would suggest, having spent much of my life in the private sector, that uh, you cannot go to any market for floating a bond or, or tax issue with projecting one year at a time. Well, I would suggest that you better not make commitments one year at a time unless you know the money's going to be on the table. And when, the, in my view... They, in, they make those adjustments all the time. They make those adjustments all the time. Well, well with all due respect, uh, I, we tried it your way 10 years ago. We relied on the promises. Oh, do it and it will come. So we did it. We passed, we passed that tax package. We, uh, the, uh, the Congress doubled military spending at the same time that it cut taxes. And won the Cold War. Huh? And won the Cold War. Well, whether, whether it won the Cold War or not, the fact is it, it caused deficits that were huge when we were promised surpluses, and that's what this package will do you again. I'm not here to debate political theology. I'm, we, I'm here to tell you on the basis of my experience on the Appropriations Committee that if you really believe that we, are, that we are going to cut defense as a percentage of GDP consistently over the next 10 years, I don't think you know your own caucus, much less mine. I can vote for that kind of a defense budget because I come from a district that has very few uh, military contractors and no defense uh, bases. But I'll bet you there are no Republicans on this committee who can vote for a defense budget like that. And if you can't, you're already going to be $500 billion short just on the defense side from the projections that are being made to justify this tax cut. We disagree. That's why if we disagree, I think the safe thing to do is to be cautious. That's all I'm asking. Be cautious. We've had a lot of talk here that, that this, this is actually a, a very proper bill because it does have a budget component uh, for the, the year covered in this matter. The, the, it's a retroactive bill, so we go back to the, two o, the, the 01 budget that was already passed. What is your answer to that? Well, it may have some re retroactive effect, but its real implications, its real impact is on the future, on the next 10 years and beyond. And for that reason, because this is a bill that entails substantial revenue reductions, a trillion seven hundred billion dollars so far, I know this bill is only a portion of it, but it's the first and largest installment on a trillion seven hundred billion dollar tax cut. The additional interest payable on the debt associated with that tax cut is $400 billion. We all know and hear that there's something in the code called the alternative minimum tax that's going to be fixed between now and the next couple of years. And when we do that, that'll cost $300 billion. That's one inevitable tax bill we'll all have to support once middle-income people find out what the AMT is all about. Add all of that up, you're talking about 2.3 to 2.4 trillion dollars, which has a significant impact on the budget, on spending choices, on the bottom line, on debt reduction, on social security. For all those reasons, it should not be done in isolation. It ought to be done in the context of a budget resolution, and that's the principle right here, emblazoned in big letters in the Congressional Budget Act. Concurrent resolution on the budget must be adopted before budget-related legislation is considered. Now, when are we going to have the concurrent budget resolution? It's on a fast track, too. We're due to mark it up by March the 21st. And if we do, we'll probably have a concurrent resolution with the Senate, maybe by the middle of our April. I don't know. We leave here in the middle of April for the Easter holiday and don't come back, but certainly we'll have it by the 1st of May. There's time to do all of this and do it in its proper place and context, and that's what I'm concerned about. So, so you agree that the budget that's referred to here is really not relevant to the tax bill we have before us today? The budget we had last year never contemplated a tax cut of this magnitude, a trillion six hundred billion dollars. Thank you. Mr. Sessions. <clears throat>
Thanks. Thank you, Chairwoman. Uh, I would like to say that uh, the gentleman from South Carolina uh, offered, I believe, in his written testimony, very good, not only information, but an analysis. I don't agree with what you have just said, but I do agree that, in fact, that process is very important and it should not be taken lightly at all. And I appreciate the gentleman's thoughtful comments uh, that he gave. And I want to ch thank Chairman Spratt for that. Mr. Obey, would you hold your chart back up from 1981? Now, if I understand correctly, this was, this was, these projections were made on the basis of supply-side economics, that magically additional revenue will come in so that we'll reduce the deficit rather <laughs> Gentleman than... Gentlemen yield. Uh, let me, I, no, when I get through, when I get through, because I was here in 1981, as was Mr. Obey, and that's all we heard in 1981 was supply-side economics that magically all this additional revenue was going to come in and that a deficit would go down. Is that, was, that, was that what happened? That's my recollection. That's what they said before the bill passed, but after the bill passed, Mr. Stockman said this. He said, Kemp Roth was always a Trojan horse to bring down the top rate. It's kind of hard to sell trickle-down, so the supply-side formula was the only way to get a tax policy that was really trickle down. Supply side is trickle down theory. Now, uh, in my view, what supply, uh, what trickle down is, is if you feed the horses enough oats, eventually the sparrows will get something to eat. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I, I will yield in a moment, but uh, my recollection also is the top rate was 70, and this brought it down to 50, and then later on we took the top rate down to, to 39. 28. Uh, I believe that there's a 39 right now, right now is the top 39.6 right But it was now. 70 at this time, and we took it down to 50, and then we took it to in steps on down. I don't remember well, when, the, when the Broadhead Amendment passed that brought it down uh, in, in the first step. Right, but uh, my, my point is that the folks at the top of the, uh, and the top uh, brackets have done very well in recent years. Uh, they've had their uh, top rate uh, almost cut in half already by the Congress. Because I remember when it was 70, and now it's, uh, now it's right. 39. And what, uh, what, and what I'm suggesting in the economic trigger that ought to occur if there is a recession uh, is, that, is that everyone get a tax cut, but that we cut only the bottom bracket, because those are the folks who are going to spend, uh, uh, spend the money uh, and add to, uh, add to uh, demand. I would also make, uh, if I could take one uh, point, or one 30-second rebuttal period, uh, when someone mentioned the fact that spending has, uh, has been what has driven this uh, Reagan deficit uh, that was produced, then let me point out discretionary spending today is 6.3 percent of, of GDP of total national income. Discretionary spending in 1962, before we ever heard of the Great Society, was 12.7 percent of GDP. And the budget that is being presented to us assumes that discretionary spending is going to drop down to around four, uh, four, four uh, to four and a quarter percent over ten years. Anybody who believes that that is likely to happen is smoking something that ain't legal. Well, Mr. Obi, my concern, because since I was here in '81, as you were, and, and some others, is that this is a bad movie that we've already seen before. And why, why do we want to see this movie again? Well, I don't, but evidently uh, we're going to. Now, uh, Mr. Spratt, I, I had the uh, privilege of serving on the Budget Committee for six years uh, during the 80s, and uh, I don't recall ever a tax bill being brought to the floor before a budget was adopted, and if we had tried to do that when we were in the majority, the Republicans would never have stopped howling. I mean, you never would have heard the end of that. I, am I wrong? Did, uh, did, did we ever bring up... And as I said... Section 303, because of the curious language of it, allows you to skirt it, but the principle is clear and it's emblazoned right there in the Congressional Budget Act. Until a concurrent budget resolution is adopted, passed, no budget-related legislation should be brought to the floor. And, and I, don't, I don't recall that ever being considered when we were in the majority, that we would have proceeded in that this way. This would apply to, and does apply, to entitlement spending as well as to uh, tax cuts applies to both sides of the budget, and for good reason. We've had, it seems to me that we've had this enormous role reversal between the two parties, and that we now are standing for conservative principles. 
Uh, we are the ones who want to pay down the debt. We're the ones who want to follow the rules. And the other side is saying, don't worry about the rules, and trust us, the debt will be okay, but let's have this tax cut first. Uh, I just uh, find it very curious uh, that uh, we really have become uh, the party standing for fiscal responsibility and uh, taking a very conservative view on this budgetary matter. Uh, I'd be happy to yield to Mr. Leonard. I'd just like to repeat the point I made. The revenues to the federal government in 1980 were 519 billion, and in 1990 is 1 trillion 54 billion. The revenues did come in. What was unrestrained was spending. I would claim uh, my time and that the point was made, and I don't remember if it was Mr. Obie or if it was one of the other witnesses, that during the Reagan administration, Congress never, in discretionary spending, exceeded the aggregate amount that Reagan sought in the budget. With one year exception. There was in one year. seven out of the eight years, the Congress spent less money than the president than President Reagan asked us to. And in fact, that was true uh, of, of all but one of the years of President Bush's administration as well. So the Congress has been uh, restrained and reasonably conservative on the spending side. My, my, my point is not to get into a theological debate about parties. My point is simply that when, when you pass this piecemeal, and Mr. Thomas said more is to come, that ought to tell you that you ought to know what the pieces are. Uh, I mean, when I play poker, uh, I like to know uh, that I'm going to be able to see all the cards in my hand before I place my final bet. Uh, I think the taxpayers would appreciate it if we'd show that same kind of caution uh, on their own uh, 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 on their own behalf. I have no other questions. I just seem to recall when I came here in 1995, I wasn't here through all the rest of it, but there was a problem with spending money because we had a dickens of a time getting a balanced budget. It took us a couple of years to do that. Mr. Spratt, you were a big part of that, which I appreciate. So um, when we talk about spending, just remember that um, it's been in the last few years that we've kept the lid on it. Gentlemen, I appreciate very much Mr. Obey and Mr. Spratt, and we'll move on to Mr. Taylor. And then we will get to the panel with Mr. Turner. Go ahead, Mr. Taylor. Thank you, Madam Chairman, and I, and I do thank the committee for sticking around. There's something that's been missing from this debate that I really think needs to be mentioned. As we speak, our nation is five trillion. Seven hundred and thirty-five billion, eight hundred and fifty-nine million, five hundred and seventy-three. I'm sorry, three hundred and eighty thousand five hundred and seventy-three dollars and ninety-eight cents in debt. In the five years, in the five months since the budget became law, this year's budget, the debt of this nation has increased by sixty-one billion. $681,170,687.12. I would really like anyone in this room to look me in the eye and tell me there's a surplus. We need that far in debt. And you know, that's not the worst of it, because not all of it is just debt that we owe to banks. We've been taking money from senior citizens on rates increased during the Reagan years with a Republican president, a Republican Senate, in a Democratic House. Their rates on individuals were increased about 15 percent, and for self-employed people, 33 percent, despite the talk of all the tax breaks during the Reagan years. And yet, to this day, we owe the recipients of the Social Security system, which is every single working American, one trillion, seventy billion dollars. It's in the so-called lockbox, and I think the reason Congress is so anxious to put a lockbox is that we don't want people to open it up and see a small piece of paper that says, I owe you one trillion, seventy billion dollars. You know, it gets worse than that. There's the Medicare trust fund. Again, a payroll tax taken out of working Americans with the promise that it would be set aside for their medicine when they need it and when they're eligible. At this moment, we owe that trust fund two hundred and twenty nine billion, two hundred million dollars. Please, Mr. President, please, Mr. Speaker, please, Mr. Majority Leader, tell me about the surplus when we owe that much money to accounts that we've taken from hardworking Americans. But, you know, it gets worse than that. How about the folks in the military? Again, in the 80s, we recognized the demographic shift in America where we're getting old. We're getting a lot more older people, a lot fewer younger people who can pay in the taxes, a lot more people who can take the money out. So they started budgeting money on an annual basis 
with the promise that it was going to be set aside to pay military retirements. We owe those folks $163 billion, $500 million. Again, if you were to open the so-called lockbox, which there is none for the military retirees, all you'd find is an IOU. It's gone. It's been spent. How about the civil service retirement system? But those folks who make our work happen, all we do is make the rules, all we do is make the laws. They go make it happen. We owe those folks $501 billion, $700 million. Again, open up the so-called lockbox, which there is none for public employees, and the president isn't talking about one for public employees. All they're going to get is an IOU. That's just some of the debt we owe. It's pretty interesting that in the first eight days of the Bush administration, Mr. Linder, a publication that for years had been called the Monthly Statement of the Public Debt was renamed to the Monthly Statement of Treasury Securities. Now, you and I are from the Deep South. I got a feeling if we went to a truck stop in Mississippi or in Georgia and went up to somebody and say, how'd you like a whole bunch of public debt? I think they'd turn us down. But if we went to that same guy and say, how would you like some free Treasury Securities? Ah, I'd like those things. It's the same thing. It's just a clever name to disguise the fact that this nation is broke and getting broker. And it really all started in the 80s. We were only about a trillion dollars in debt when the Reagan tax cuts passed with a Democratic House and a Democratic Senate, but the changes took place with a Republican Senate, I would point out. To the point of my amendment, I'd like to quote President Ronald Reagan in 1983. He says, today all of us can look each other square in the eye and say we kept our promises. We promised that we would protect the financial integrity of Social Security. We have. We promised that we would protect beneficiaries against any loss incurred benefits. We have. And we promised to attend to the needs of those still working, not only those work Americans nearing retirement, but young people just entering the labor force. And we've done that too. The changes in this legislation will allow Social Security to age as gracefully as all of us hope to do ourselves without becoming an overwhelming burden to generations to come. That's when they raised the rates 15% on working Americans. That's when they raised the rates 33% on self-employed Americans with the promise that it would be set aside. But guess what, Mr. Linder? It wasn't set aside. It was spent. So what I'm saying is that before this Congress does that again, before we take the military's retirees trust fund and squander it, before we take another petty from Medicare and squander it, before we take another penny from Social Security, we add as a provision to this tax bill that it only kicks into effect when we have fulfilled our annual obligations to those trust funds. That if we really have a surplus, and let's remember last year, after you take out the trust funds, we had an $8 billion surplus, not a $239 billion surplus, an $8 billion surplus after the trust funds. And let me tell you where two and a half billion of that came from. You see, the budget that I voted against delayed the pay for the troops from September the 29th to October 1st. Now, for a guy like you and me, delaying our pay is no big deal. We make good money. But if you're in E4 with a couple of kids, that meant you didn't get paid that Friday. You got paid the following Monday. So you spent a weekend looking under the couch for pennies so you could buy diapers, so you could buy baby formula. All it did was transfer that $2.5 billion pay period from last year to this year. So the real surplus was not $8 billion, but was $5.5 billion. Now, that's one trick that I caught. Don't tell them how many tricks I didn't catch. So isn't it fair to say to our fellow Americans who are working right now to pay our salaries, pay everybody in this room salary, I presume, that we're not going to do this to them again? We're not going to give them a tax break on one hand, as they did on the 80s, but turn around and raise the rates Promise that money would be set aside, but spend it someplace else. Isn't it fair to say, if we're going to do this, if there really is a surplus after we've paid into Social Security what we owe them, after we've paid into Medicare what we've owed them, after we've paid into the public employer's retirement system, all you young people are sitting here, that's your, that's your retirement. After we've paid into the military retirement system, all those great people who are serving us in Bosnia, Kosovo, Colombia, places where they can get killed today, those National Guardsmen, who died in your state last, just last week that I deeply regret. Only after we fulfill our obligations to you does this kick into effect, because we've already made promises to you that we really haven't been keeping. But we're going to change that. We're going to start keeping that promise. 
So the amendment I offer is straightforward. I think it's in keeping with what the president said. He did not mention the military retirees by name, but I think if he knew we owed them $163 billion, he'd be for this. He did not mention the public employees' retirement system by name, but I think if he knew we owed them $501 billion, that he'd be for this. And so if we're really sincere, Madam Chairman, in being straightforward with the American people, if you really think there's a surplus after we pay off the trust funds, then I would hope you would welcome this amendment because I think it's in keeping with the president said in his State of the Union address. What you're saying is annual contribution to the trust fund is what your bill says. That's correct. Okay, Mr. Linder. I don't disagree with much of what you said, Gene, except for one thing. It didn't start in the 80s. It started in 1967 when all those trust funds were put in a unified budget so we could pay for a war without having to tax for a war. And every Congress since 1967 until 1997 spent those trust funds with abandon. And it's, we've come a long way in the last few years because at least we're talking about, we haven't passed the trust fund, the lockbox yet because the Democrats in the Senate held it up under filibuster. We passed it in the House. But I think at least we're talking about it and I'm pleased to hear you talking about it because I agree with your, your point on it. Well, Mr. Luna, if I may, and I really do think we're coming from the same place. And it, I mean, these numbers are shocking. I was dumbfounded when I looked at the, at the Treasury statements, when everybody kept talking about these record surpluses to see that it really wasn't there, but it's all trust funds. And I really think the American people are demanding honesty from us. Just want us to be straight with them. If there's a surplus, give it back. But let's repay what we've already taken from these folks. And with this amendment, we can see to it that we stop taking on an annual basis, that we at least start from this day forward doing what you said, paying what we owe right now on an annual basis, and then as is possible, we ought to be repaying what has already been taken. And what has already been taken is astronomical as far as the amount of money. Again, a half a trillion from the public employees retirement system, 163 billion from the military retirees, over a trillion from Social Security, another 200 plus billion from Medicare. That's a lot of money. And your numbers come from Treasury figures. These are straight from the Treasury reports. Okay. Madam Chairman, I would like to submit all of this for the yes, record. Yes, please do. Which includes, incidentally, the World Wide Web access, because I would like my fellow citizens to see these numbers, because they're also astronomical. It's hard to believe, but I want them to see them for themselves. Very good. Mr. Moakley? I'm uh, very impressed. I've uh, heard some of these figures mm -hmm. before, and uh, I'm glad that we've got somebody keeping record. And. Uh, I don't know if lockboxes really do the trick because every congressman has a skeleton key. So, you know, those lockboxes can be opened also. If I may, Mr. Moakley, yeah. the, the point of this is the tax breaks that some of us have concerns about only come into effect in those years when there is an honest to goodness surplus after we have met our obligations to military retirees, Medicare, Social Security, and no, our I, own federal employees. No, I get the gentleman's point, and it's well stated, very articulate. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Thank Taylor. You. Um, Mr. Turner, I don't see Mr. John, and Mr. Boyd um, submitted his uh, testimony for the record, so would you like to proceed? Uh, yes, thank you, Ms. Myrick. I will submit uh, Congressman John's statement on That's his very behalf. Good. Thank you. Uh, the three of us uh, came here today as the three co chairs of the Blue Dog Democrat Coalition. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mr. Taylor is also a member of the Blue Dog Coalition, as uh, we have 33 members now in that coalition. And we really know it's late in the day, but just to briefly state why we came, we have great concerns about the failure to uh, adopt a budget, budget resolution prior to acting on major tax cuts. And our sense is that uh, what we've found is that we have gotten uh, in a position where we're talking more about what we disagree on than what we really should be talking about, and that is what we can agree on. Because I don't think anyone would deny that uh, we're somewhat captive of the fact that the uh, current rules provide that the CBO is going to give us a 10-year uh, budget forecast. And I think most of us understand the uncertainty of that. Historically, it's certainly uh, proven to be unreliable. Uh, maybe it's more reliable than forecasting the weather for the te next 10 years, but perhaps not too much better. And I think all of us also understand that uh, uh, there is money for a tax cut. Uh, in my discussions with uh, colleagues on both sides of the aisle, I find no one who is opposed to a tax cut. 
and I, I think that it's important for us to recognize that if we were to be short, talking about a shorter term budget projection, we probably wouldn't be engaged in the disagreements that uh, I've heard in this room today and in, in the Ways and Means Committee and that we'll hear on the floor of the House. Because the truth is uh, about two thirds of this even projected uncertain budget forecast is in the last five years of this decade. Uh, the first five years, most of us would agree, is probably a more reliable uh, estimate because it's shorter term. And I have no doubt that if we were able to uh, look at a shorter term projection of surplus, we could all agree on the right size for the tax cut. Uh, the Blue Dogs took a position about a week ago. We said that as a group, we were going to fight for a budget first before we supported tax cuts of the magnitude that have been uh, sub, uh, advocated by the president. Uh, in our view, it's like a tax cut the president's laying out may be kind of like trying to, to put a size 11 foot into a size 6 shoe. And we're not sure that it's all going to work out. And all we're doing is asking that we have the opportunity to have a good, solid debate, uh, air the various points of view. And the president said, you know, we can hold spending to 4% annually over the next uh, 10 years. Uh, Senator Domenici the other day, I understand, said, well, he thought maybe 6% was a more appropriate number. The truth is, no matter what we say, the president says, or anybody else says, it's what we actually do. And collectively, uh, we can, I think, come closer to that number if we go through this annual budget debate and talk about how much we need to spend for the various categories of our federal government. So I think we ought to take a step back and our plea to this committee is not to move forward with this rule and give this uh, house an opportunity to debate a budget and the president pledged to come to town with uh, the effort uh, make a good faith effort to bring a new tone to Washington uh, we can contribute a lot to that effort right here in this house by acknowledging that all of us want a tax cut by acknowledging that if we look to the shorter term we can have a better uh, feel for the size that tax cut should be and I think that we all understand the necessity of holding down spending. Uh, we could have just as easily, I suppose, asked for a 25 or 30 year forecast. You know, I read the other day on a report from the Social Security uh, uh, system that uh, in 50 years, the Social Security system, if we maintain it with the current levels of benefits, would require a 50 percent payroll tax. We know we're not going to have a 50 percent payroll tax, but it certainly tells us that the longer term outlook for the federal government is not nearly as bright as the one we're talking about over the next 10 years. So our effort is simply to highlight that issue here today, urge this committee uh, to move slowly and to allow us to have a chance for a good budget debate before we move forward with the major tax cuts. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Linder. Mr. Moakley. I uh, agree with you. I'd love to see a nice budget that takes into consideration all this, and I'd like to see a spirited debate go on for five, six, and ten hours, but uh, there's only four members on this side, and I don't think we're going to see it. Mr. Reynolds, did you have any questions? Mr. Frost. I'd just like to compliment my colleague from Texas, who is serving as the policy uh, co-chair of the Blue Dogs and has taken a leadership role in this and uh, on economic matters, budgetary matters. And I think uh, your position is a very sound one, and I think uh, you speak for most of us from Texas. And I want to uh, urge you on. Thank, thank you. you. Ms. Slaughter. Appreciate your hard work. Thanks thank you very much. Here. Thank you for your time. We'll now move on to Mr. Romer. Ms. Tauscher, if you'd like to join him, you're welcome to. I'll sit with Tim Romer. Well, all Good. right, Ms. Tauscher, the gentle lady from California. <laughs> Pleasure yeah. to be here. Eddie Bernice, excuse me, Ms. Johnson. <laughs> oh, good. Come on up, Bernice. How are you? Good. I'm going to be very brief, Madam Chair. First of all, nice to see you, and it's been a pleasure to work with you on some bipartisan uh, issues through the course of the years, and uh, nice to be here in the Rules Committee. Uh, Mr. Moakley, uh, our heart, our souls, our prayers all go out to you, and uh, uh, we're all so proud of uh, your contributions uh, to public service and to this great Rules Committee as well, too. It's nice to be with all of you. 
Uh, I'm going to be very, very brief. Uh, first of all, uh, I'm going to uh, uh, speak on behalf of the New Democrats, uh, an organization that I uh, co-founded and now co-chair, a group of about 74 Democrats, and a group that we've just recently put together, uh, the new a House Centrist Committee, a group of about 10 Democrats and Republicans working together, that believe that a trigger mechanism which would uh, make sure that we make certain targets on paying down the debt before tax cuts are then phased in would be considered by the Rules Committee and be part of our debate tomorrow. Uh, this has got bipartisan support. It's got bicameral support. Uh, we had a press conference today with uh, Ms. Tosher from California providing a lot of good leadership. Uh, and uh, we had uh, Olympia Snow, a Republican from Maine, and Evan Bayh, a Democrat from Indiana, with a host of other members leading the way, saying this is important in order to make sure that we don't go back into the deficit spending days uh, that we have fought so hard on both sides of the aisle, Democrats and Republicans, uh, to dig ourselves out of. So I want to put in uh, my strong support and bipartisan endorsement for a trigger that Alan Tosher will speak more to specifically. Secondly, I want to speak to these so-called surpluses. And I think you've heard uh, through the course of the day uh, that uh, uh, a 0.40 percent change in growth in the economy can result in about a trillion dollar difference in uh, projected surpluses. A trillion dollars, we double that to 0 0.80, not even a 1% difference in growth, and we've got almost $2 trillion, which is about the, the cost of this proposed tax cut. Uh, this tax cut is talked about uh, being at a $1.6 billion or $1.6 trillion level. The administration has even said that that does not include the deferment on debt payments. And when you do some adjustment for AMT, we have about a $2.3 trillion cost. That could disappear in months, let alone years. I think uh, taking a cautious, conservative, and very, very uh, principled approach on this tax cut, and I, I voted for a host of tax cuts last year. I think the American people deserve some. We can't just put the dessert cart up to the American people and to, and to members of Congress. And this is, you've seen the dessert cart, Madam Chair, with a host of pies and ice creams and cakes and everything, and we all just pick and choose from this. The trigger would put some discipline into this process and um, also allow us some spirited debate through the course of the next several weeks, I would hope, to discuss the size and the fairness of this tax cut as well. Uh, I intend to vote for some tax cuts uh, if they're fair. Uh, I hope to work in a bipartisan way. And the third point I would make, and, and then I will defer to my colleagues, is one of bipartisanship. We've had a president uh, who I went down to Austin to meet with in December talk a great deal about bipartisanship and a great deal about civility. This town needs both, and it needs the civility of, of trust and of respect to one another across the aisle. That's certainly something that we're trying to do with the House Centrist Coalition with people like Amo Houghton and Fred Upton and others. We don't get there if we talk about it and then we propose a tax cut that even people at this table want very much to work on in a bipartisan way are excluded from. Or when we bring up ergonomics, and we have very, very strong feelings on both sides of the aisle that are highly respected. I respect the other side of this. It's a complicated issue. But when we are then told that we can't even have time to debate that for a couple hours, and we go into recess, and nobody is allowed to speak on the House floor, that really cuts at the very meaning and the very principle about practicing bipartisanship when we're trying to improve civility in this town. So I really hope that uh, the Rules Committee and members of both sides of the aisle will really look out to, in a principled way, not only look at the spirit of bipartisanship and patting each other on the back 
and getting photo ops and saying we're going to work in a bipartisan way, but then practicing that in a substantive way to have people come together that want very much to work for the American people on reforming the estate tax, on reforming marriage tax penalty, on reducing some of the rates in a fair way for eighty and ninety thousand uh, dollars a year people, uh, to do something about the AMT. We want to work on those issues in a bipartisan way. This process excludes us, and uh, we hope that that can be improved in the future. And I thank you for your patience. Well, I um, agree with you that I hope we can work together bipartisanly, and I want to thank you for having done that over the years, and I really regret your leaving. Thank you, so Appreciate that. <laughs> Ms. Dasher. Madam Chair, it's always good to see you. Mr. Moakley, always well to see you. And members of the uh, Rules Committee, I'm here uh, to uh, talk about the amendment that I'm offering that is an attempt to add a trigger mechanism or a safety valve to the marginal rate reduction package that we'll debate tomorrow. Um, as someone, as uh, someone who has supported tax cuts last year and, and years before, um, I also believe we must balance these cuts with other priorities like paying down the debt, securing Social Security and Medicare, and leaving enough money for increases that we have generally all agreed to uh, in education, defense, and a real prescription drug benefit and other priorities in a new balanced budget with new caps. Uh, and, but in order to achieve this balance in the absence of a budget resolution, how do we actually know that we are going to have enough surplus to meet our priorities without either creating deficits to fund the tax cuts or carving into Social Security or Medicare? And the answer is we know we don't. We don't know that. Um, the tax package before us is based on 10-year projections. Uh, we know that those 10-year projections were done by the people that projected the snowfall for the week this week in Washington. Uh, they are as unreliable as the two feet of snow that we should be digging out right now. And the truth of the matter is, thank goodness we're not. Well, if you, if you want to get it, come up to my state, we got it. <laughs> three feet. Well, I'd hate to think that we were sitting around trying to find the snow uh, to dig out of or trying to find the trillion dollars that the CBO miscalculated just last year. Uh, and the good news is that, yes, they've been off in the right direction most recently, but the bad news is that all they have to do is jig a little bit to the right or to the left and be off a trillion dollars, and we're really in the soup. And my constituents in California certainly don't want us to be in a position where we're funding tax cuts with deficits because they're looking for the predictability of low interest rates. They're looking for the predictability of an economy that's going to widen the winter circle for more American working families. Uh, I also support, as I said, very limited future spending, and I think we can work when we get a budget resolution to make sure that we're building on the balanced budget agreement of 1997 and have caps that are going to be responsible so that we're not spending the money here and that we actually are keeping our promises to return it to the American people. But due to Germany issues, obviously I'm not going to be able to offer anything that would talk about uh, for, uh, the budget caps uh, on discretionary spending. Uh, but what I do want to talk about is this amendment that would provide an emergency shutoff valve if the projected surpluses don't actually materialize. Uh, this would not raise taxes. Um, it would suspend the rate reduction phase-ins until we again meet our debt reduction targets. We would essentially ask the Secretary of Treasury to certify that we are not in deficit spending and that we are on target to reduce our publicly held debt and we will make sure that we can meet all of our nation's priorities without returning to the dark days of deficit spending. I think that this is a very important opportunity. Uh, we do have a bicameral and bipartisan effort, uh, a concurrent resolution that's also going to be offered in the next few days. Um, I think centrists in both the House and the Senate are very interested in making sure that we build on the opportunities of the future, not go back to the past. I think Mr. Frost mentioned uh, the movie of the 80s. We were in that movie and we starred in it. And many of us realize that we don't want to go back to a time where we make promises that we can't keep and that we're funding tax cuts with deficits. I also want to build on what my colleague, Mr. Romer, talked about. You know, we're in the very beginning of a new administration, and I have great hopes for the opportunity to work with the Bush administration, as I have had the great luck of working with many of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle and in, and in the Senate. This is a, a litmus test, per se. This is the first big thing that we're going to do in this new Congress with this new administration. And I think it would send a very, very bad signal to the American people who are watching very, very closely that we are not really going to do what we promised to do, that we're not going to come to Washington and turn our backs on partisan politics and try to work together for their betterment. 
but if things don't change and, and actually we don't have an opportunity to offer amendments like my amendment, Mr. Horn's amendment, uh, or even Nick Smith's amendment on a trigger, or if we're not able to deal with the other issues that have come forth today, and we find ourselves in a position where we have a, a closed rule or a modified rule where we really stifle debate tomorrow, I think, unfortunately, I will feel very much like we haven't changed, that we didn't learn the lessons of the past, and that we'll find ourselves in a situation where it will be very difficult for me to convince my constituents, since I will not be convinced, that this new administration is really anxious to work with Democrats uh, and with Republicans and with people of different points of view. I think there's plenty of time tomorrow for us to have a vigorous debate about this. And I think that it is important for the Rules Committee to do their will, but at the same time, I think to show that the House of Representatives is not going to kick this can across the aisle to the Senate, that we're not going to abdicate our responsibilities to have a full debate, that we're not going to abdicate our responsibilities to cure this bill in areas where we know we can improve it, in fairness, in fiscal responsibility, and in, and in the issue of the budget. And I would hate to think that I came here to Washington to be a member of the House of Representatives, but that I really decided to just give my responsibilities to the Senate, because they're going to act slow, more slowly and more maturely and take longer to do this. I don't think there's any rush to judgment why we should do this tomorrow. And if we're going to do it tomorrow, I would hope we have a sizable, lengthy debate with amendments and with the offer and, and, and with substitutes so that we as Democrats and as, as Republicans can work together to get the best tax cut for the American people, and that we go into the conference with some strength and with support, not a very narrow narrow vote. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, all the talk of bipartisanship, are you all going to the retreat? Actually, I've been there twice, and I take my civility medication regularly. My daughter has a horse show and a, and a flute uh, recital mm -hmm. on the weekend. I'll be there with my wife and four children, and uh, we will tear the place up in celebration or <laughs> Whatever, in frustration, right. one way or another. We intend to go, and I think it's a, a very worthwhile event to attend. Ms. Johnson, how about you? Are you going to the retreat? I am not going to the retreat, but it's not a boycott. I had taken an engagement prior to National Association of Black Mayors mm -hmm. uh, in Savannah, Georgia, had uh, invited me to come and speak and receive an award, so that's why I won't be there. Uh, I am here to say um, I'm accustomed to working bipartisanly. My district is between Dick Army, Sam Johnson, and Pete Sessions, <laughs> and Martin Frost just has a little tail on the back end of it. Both Mr. Bush, uh, President Bush, and Mr. Cheney lived in Dallas, where I'm from. And I know he promised this tax cut, and I think he's a man that wants to keep his word. But I think that we as a Congress need to rescue him from that commitment, because I don't think we can afford it. But if we are determined uh, to have this um, tax bill, I really want a tax break. I, I, I need one, uh, but I think it needs to be a bit more reasonable. But while we are considering it, I have an amendment. I introduced this as a freestanding bill, but the reality is if it doesn't go on as an amendment, as a Democrat, it's not moving. It might not move anyway. But what it is is to take the tax off of unemployment compensation. Um, this unemployment compensation usually go to the lowest waged people. And although the states set the rates, they're pretty low. And this is approximately less than 2% of the total amount of the tax uh, cut we're talking about. We're talking about people that take home about $200 a week on average uh, when they're on unemployment compensation. And so since the, all of the talk is about this is for the 1% of the wealthiest, where they get $46,000 off a year and the average other people might get 200 and something. Uh, this group is, is virtually in dire po poverty uh, when they're on unemployment compensation. 90% of them owe taxes now on that because they simply cannot pay it. And so that's what my amendment is, is to ask that the taxes be removed for unemployment compensation. But do you know what the actual dollar figure is of your amendment? Uh, well, that's fine. You can take a minute and we'll go on and see if there are any questions.
$1.4 billion annually. Okay, thank you. All right, let's go to questions. Mr. Linder, you don't have any questions? Mr. Moakley said he would be back in a minute. He is not at the moment. Um, if um, I don't think there's anybody else that uh, is here to speak, or if not, then the committee is going to stand in recess subject to the call of the chair. So we thank you all for your testimony. The uh, Rules Committee will reconvene. I'd first like to express my appreciation to the gentlewoman from Charlotte, North Carolina, for the able job she did in presiding over the, uh, the final uh, hour or so of our uh, hearing process, and to say that we're here for further consideration of H.R. 3, the Economic Growth and Tax Relief Act of 2001. The chair will be in receipt of a motion. Well, Mr. Chairman, I move the committee grant H.R. 3, the Economic Growth and Tax Relief Act of 2001, a modified closed rule providing one hour of general debate equally dividing control by the chairman and ranking order member of the Committee on Ways and Means. Rule waives all points of order against consideration of the bill. Rule provides that the amendment recommended by the Committee on Waste Means now printed in the bill shall be considered as adopted. The rule further provides for consideration of the amendment in the nature of substitute printed in the report if offered by Representative Wrangell or his designee, which shall be considered as read and shall be separately debatable for one hour equally divided and controlled by the proponent and an opponent. The rule also weighs all points of order against consideration of the amendment printed in the report. Finally, the rule provides one motion to recommit with or without instruction. So moved, Mr. You've Chairman. heard the motion of the gentleman from Sanibel. Any discussion or amendment? Let me first say that... Uh, you can see that with this modified closed rule, we have uh, made an order, the Wrangell substitute that he proposed in the Ways and Means Committee to address the concerns of uh, our friends uh, in the minority. And so I can assume from that uh, that you all will be very supportive of this uh, rule and have no amendments. Is that a correct assumption, Mr. Moakley? Uh, I don't think so, Mr. Chairman. Oh, okay. Well, Chair is happy I'm, to recognize. I mean, I, I thank you for uh, Mr. making Moakley. Mr. Wrangell an honor, and Mr. Wrangell, thank you. Uh, but I think that it's such a... <coughs> large budget. I think that if we just increase the debate time from one no. to two hours, it would be much more appreciated by the uh, the general population and also the members of the floor. So I would like to okay. make that motion. You've heard the motion of the gentleman from uh, Boston. If there's uh, any discussion... Uh, Aren't you going to grant it just automatically? No, not automatically. Let me just say that... Uh, we uh, have obviously spent a great deal of time on this. It's uh, been debated on the floor. That's why I on the floor and special orders on. So you, you uh, want more time. I think that we've been debating this for, uh, some of us, about two decades. I know, but yeah. I think the people who aren't members of the Rules Committee would like to know what we're talking about. And I think it's oh, yeah, well, it's been debated not only here in the Rules Committee, but uh, also uh, on the floor. But anyway, I'd, I'd urge a no vote on the motion. Uh, those in favor will say aye. Those opposed, aye. no. Yeah. Been the chair the noes have it. The noes have it. The motion is not agreed to. Are there further amendments? Yes. Mr. Moakley. Mr. Chairman, I move the committee amend the rule to require that Congress must first adopt the budget resolution before the House takes up the tax bill. Uh, you know, I know that they talk about a budget, but the budget amendment that they refer to uh, was made long before uh, this this big tax bill came by, and, and it, it, there was there's no relation between the both of them. And I know that technically, maybe it covers the law, but I think that. People want the spirit of the law, the letter of the law, and I think we should have a full budget debate before we decide who to give the money to and how much money we get to give. Well, let me just say uh, in, in response that clearly we have uh, we've seen a budget which does uh, provide an adequate sum that would cover this tax measure, and uh, so I would urge a no vote on the Moakley Amendment. Any uh, further discussion? If not, the vote occurs on the Moakley Amendment. Those in favor will say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. Chairman, no, on the pain of the chair, the no's have no's have the motion is uh, need, not agreed to. We need, Clerk will call the roll. The, we have to let the Clerk entire the world know how we vote. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Goss. No. Mr. Linder. Mr. Price. Mr. G.S. Ballard. Mr. Hastings. No. Mr. Clyburn. No. Mr. Session. No. Mr. Reynolds. Okay. Mr. Moakley. Yes. Mr. Frost. Mr. Paul, yes. Mrs. Slaughter. Mr. Chairman. No. Clerk, Mr. Diaz Ballard is here. I think he'd probably like to vote no, I suspect. Yeah. Is that right? Did you want to vote no? That's what I yeah, thought. No, no, yeah. That's what the I answer is that I vote no. How's Mr. Diaz Ballard recorded? He's recorded as voting no. For many times. Total. <laughs> 
Enough for us to win. Florida. <laughs> Florida. Clerk, report the total. And the motion is uh, not. The vote is not. The motion is not agreed to. Are there further amendments, Mr. Chairman? Mr. Moakley. I don't know if you're in the room when uh, Gene Taylor really went through all the trust funds and how many, how much in depth we are in to each uh, trust fund and. He offered an amendment that all these trust funds should be paid off before we give in, uh, before we uh, spend the so-called surplus money, because he feels it really isn't surplus because that all the money that's owed these trust funds. An uh, so, so those is an amendment. I'd rather read the whole thing that mm -hmm. it is part of the record. So okay. I move the committee make an order amendment number five offered by Mr. Taylor. You've heard the motion of the gentleman from Massachusetts. Any discussion or amendment? If not, the vote occurs on the Moakley amendment. Those in favor will say aye. aye. Those opposed, no, no. Uh, and the finisher, the those have those have the motion is not agreed to. Are there further, are there uh, further? Record, uh, record vote, Mr. Chairman. Clerk, call the roll. No. <laughs> No. 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 We don't want to do that. Mr. Frost is not here. It's an old habit I get into. Mr. Reynolds is here. Mr. Hall. Yes. Mrs. Slaughter. Yes. Mr. Chairman. Uh, no. And Mr. Reynolds. No. Clerk will report. Three and the motion is uh, not agreed to. Are there further amendments, Mr. Hall? Mr. Chairman, I uh, have an amendment uh, in order, Mrs. Tauscher's uh, trigger amendment. This adds a trigger mechanism to ensure that each phase in of the tax cut will take effect only if future surpluses actually materialize. You've heard the motion of the gentleman. Any discussion or amendment? If not, the vote occurs on the uh, gentleman's motion. Those in favor will say aye. aye. Those aye. opposed, no. No. And the aye. finisher, the no's have, no's have the motion is not agreed to. Are there further amendments? Call, uh, Clerk, call the roll. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Gross. No. Mr. Winder. Mr. Price. Mr. Hall. Mr. Hastings. No. No. Mrs. Myrick. No. Mr. Sessions. No. Mr. Reynolds. No. Mr. Moakley. Yes. Mr. Frost. Mr. Hall. Uh, yes. Mrs. Slaughter. Yes. Mr. Chairman. No. Mr. Clerk will report. And the uh, motion is not agreed to. Are there further amendments? If not, the vote occurs Mr. on the chairman. Oh, I have, a, I have an amendment. Oh, Mr. Hall. One more amendment. Mr. Chairman, I move the committee make an order the OB safer tax cut amendment. You've heard the motion of the gentleman. Any discussion or amendment or uh, any discussion? If not, the vote occurs on the Hall Amendment. Those in favor will say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. 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 And the chair, the chair, the no's have it, the no's have it. The motion is not agreed to. There are further amendments. Mrs. Slaughter. Chairman, I have amendments. I move the committee make an order Ms. Johnson's amendment number seven to exempt unemployment compensation from federal taxation. You've heard the motion of the gentlewoman from New York. Any discussion? If not, the vote occurs on the Slaughter Amendment. Those in favor will say aye. Those opposed, aye. no. No. The chair, the no's have it, the no's have it. The motion is not agreed to. There are further amendments. Yeah. If not, the vote occurs on the motion of the gentleman from Florida. Mr. Goss, those in favor will say Mr. Sorry, I'm sorry, go ahead. Those in favor will say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. no. Okay, the chair, the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The motion is agreed to. And this will be managed for the. I want a recorded vote. I want a recorded vote on final passage now, okay? Yes. Clerk, call the roll. Mr. Goss. Aye. Mr. Lincoln. Aye. Mr. Goss. Mr. Yes. Mr. Hastings. Aye. Aye. Mr. Sessions. Aye. Mr. Reynolds. Aye. Mr. Mobley. No. Mr. Frost. No. Mr. Hall. No. Mr. Slaughter. No. Mr. Chairman. Aye. Clerk will report. Eight days, four minutes. And the motion is agreed to, and accordingly, Mr. Reynolds will be managing for the majority. And accordingly, Mr. Moakley. And Mr. Moakley for the minority. And uh, with that, the Rules Committee stands adjourned. Thank you all very much for uh, your forbearance. Thank you.